Welcome to the patch read. That's right. We're going to be looking through the newest AOE4 pop notes. And we're going to be uh, deep diving. Like, subscribe, follow the channel, all that kind of crap. Let's move in. So, first of all, new game mode, Nomad. Very good. Very big Pugus. Um, kind of surprised it took this long to make it here, considering how uh, like how popular, rather, the Nomad game has been since it got introduced, uh, usually through the Mega Random, but of course, Nomad itself. I've actually been a big fan of the idea of maybe making tournaments that feature Nomad at its core, simply because it gives flexibility on the starting opening. Um, the only difference is maybe there needs to be a speed up of building your initial TC, or I believe for something like Mr. Merlin and his recent tournament, he'd done it where um, there was a three minute peace time, so you couldn't just cheese someone straight away. Um, but definitely think there's some potential here. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Age of Empires 2 has tournament gamers that do this kind of thing already. So glad to see that. Choosing the mode. Um, cool. Yeah, I don't. I, I, yada, yada. That's just about that. So mod browser update, dynamic search. So players can now uh, see mod search results appear as soon as they start typing. Nice, that's kind of convenient. Um, popular search, this is very good. I think this is actually a really big deal. It is right now in the mod scene, like not having access to like a clear way of finding what's popular is kind of a mess because you can't just, as a community, you can't easily decide uh, what the meta is in terms of mod selection. So Nice kind of change there. Um, some nice tweaks around there. Still a lot of work that needs to be done on the mod side. Um, really, really think that from a relic standpoint, and I've said this time and time again, and I'll keep saying it until I die or they do it. Someone on the, some people on the dev team need to go make custom game modes. They need to prove how elegant their mod tools are because I've heard from a few people that actually use it. There is a lot you can do with those mod tools, but it's so convoluted and complicated. It's very difficult to figure out. You're not going to get people putting the time to figure it out until you prove yourself what you can do. And I think from there, like, you know, the possibility is kind of endless. But let's focus on the, the more nerdy stuff, the more game-related stuff, instead of getting into a whole mod discussion because that would be a totally different video. New maps! Four legs! <laughs> Round of applause, Relic. Round of applause. You tried to do one yourself, and you know what? The community told you to go do one. No one likes the weird-ass version of Four Lakes you made. I'm glad you all finally recognized that Four Lakes had just done it better. We are getting the, the better version of that crappy map that's already in the game. Can anyone in chat remember the name of the ripoff map that's in the game? I forget its name. It's in Quick Match. I don't think it's in Ranked. Um, but we had a, a an attempt by Relic to essentially... I don't know, Forest ponds? Yes, thank you, forest ponds. Forest peons sounds more appropriate because I feel like everyone's peed in those ponds. Four ponds uh, is, you know, it's not that good. It's in ranked? Okay, that makes it even worse. It's it's not that good. I, I don't, compared to four lakes, like, you know, maybe forest ponds, uh, four ponds, whatever that's called, can be its own map, but it, it just doesn't really compare to four lakes to do the same thing. Like, I think they can be different maps, but definitely needs to be developed further. Uh, Continental. So this one, an extensive island surrounded by ocean. The water holds a numerous fish and stealth areas to ambush your foes. With water restricting maneuverability, your TC will be... Wait. Isn't this just the one that they used in the the 3v3 tournament? Right? It is, right? It's... Coastal. Is this literally, it, it sounds like coastal, right? So I remember glancing this and reading Continental and it sounded like it was going to be an island map. Do you know there was that, there's one in AOE 2. I mean, we can just search AOE 2 Continental, can't we? I mm. thought it was going to be the one. Now you're my stream. Yo, what up, Benny boy? How's it going, Demu? Hope you had a good stream, bud. We caught one of your games earlier. I can't remember who it was against. We also had a very elegant way of choosing whether we were going to cast your games. It was the spin the wheel. <laughs> I uh, hope you had a good stream. So, yeah, so they're adding in Continental. With, yeah, it's literally the one we... we It's Coastal. So, once again, we'll find out if it's actually better or worse than the one that EGC created. So far, EGC uh, has one up on them with Four Lakes, which is why they just went back to it. I was kind of expecting them to do kind of a, a map where you're fully on an island, and then, like, there's another island. Uh, kind of like Warring Islands, but a little bit different. Because I know there's a map in AOE 2 like that. Glad they didn't do that, because I just don't think Naval was there yet, that it's feasible. And then finally, they're adding in Marshland, which is an open and aggressive environment set deep into the jungle, surrounded by boggy grounds. Uh, there are vast amounts of forests you can hide in to surprise your opponents, and 
though there are plenty of resources scattered in the swamps, but where the dangerous wildlife. So are we going to have more wolves for this one? Maybe more wolves? No point having more boars, because I know they've ruined boars. We'll get to that a little bit later. Why does this just kind of sound like... So, correct if I'm wrong, folks. Does marshland not just sound like wetlands? Right? Marshlands just sounds like wetlands. <laughs> this description is basically wetlands. So I'm curious to know what they've done that's going to be so different because wetlands actually has a decent amount of stealth forests. Um, it's technically a swamp, right? Because basically wetlands is a ripoff of Frisian marshes and Frisian marshes is swamplands because Adney is Dutch. And of course, the first thing he wanted to do with his first map was make it his homelands. Um, where only the tall people survive because all the short babies drown. But yeah, this this sounds a lot like wetlands. What about calling it wet marsh? That's right. It needs to be kind of wetter and more marshy like. And that's why it's marshlands. Let's move on from that one because we'd have to see it first. We're going to get to see it later on, of course. Uh, Minimap zooming. It, they done it, guys. They done it. We've been asking for it for so long. Finally, you can zoom in on the map. Hopefully, it resizes the HUD. Uh, or zoom button to lower the right of the minimap hard. Wait. So, wait, 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 wait. Does this not in... Oh, uh, no. So, I don't think this changes the size of your HUD. I think this changes the zoom. Which is, at least from my perspective and everyone I've talked to, 100% not what we were asking for. Right? I I really, really, really hope when I get on the pop, it's not a button that zooms me in so I can't see the full map. This has to be like the resizing of my head we done a moment ago. The hard needs to go bigger. Like Dota 2 has this and it's wonderful. You can have like a normie map size or you can just make it like even bigger and take up a bigger chunk of your screen. And to be honest, this bottom right of the screen in AOE 4 has enough real estate to have a bigger HUD. So I hope that's what they've done. To be honest, after playing the company here as free beta, I can see they have no problem of making obnoxiously, stupidly over large HUD pieces. So I'm hoping that's what they've done here. Um, if it's just a plus minus button that means I won't see the whole map, bad, very bad. But seeing as they've done this, right, that, that means we're going to have a pause function, right? Pause function. No? Or maybe, maybe we'll see. Maybe it's in UI UX. There better be a pause function. So art of war changes. Um, we're surprised to see how many challenges you guys done. Okay, so just challenges. What to do? New cheat code. Minimally minimal. Oh, hides all the UI. Oh, that's kind of nice. It's much easier for making clickbait videos. <laughs> pause is coming soon. Wait, it's please tell me it's in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're right. I just have to play the campaign. That's that's correct, Kiwi. Yeah, yeah. So so if I just like who needs to. Also, in fairness, you know, who wants to play the online game? Like, yeah, you guys are probably bored of the online game. Just go play the campaign. It's completely different. Uh, let's move in UI UX. So improve hard uh, unit stats panels. Movement speed will now be shown top level. Very good, actually. Think I, I like that change. They need to be careful with these things, though, because I've said before, if you have too much info on screen, similar to on a broadcast, you overwhelm your uh, your viewer or your player, and it's just not good. It's, it's called screen pollution. Like, you don't want to do it. Uh, additional weapons and their stats are now available in the detail stats overlay. Primary and secondary weapons for units as well as emplacement. Secondary weapons. I assume that means for knights, so you can now see the lance damage and then the sword damage. Because there's no point showing the damage a longbow does and the damage that the stabby stabby knife does because they never use their stabby stabby knife because of how easy it is to dodge. As in, you can just force them to not use a knife. In fact, do they... I feel like they don't even melee anymore, right? I'm pretty sure Lombos don't even melee. Like, ranged units don't melee anymore. They used to if they were attacking what was attacking them. But the way it used to work that was very easy to, like, exploit was let's say I'm using ranged units and you come and attack me. I just click them all to attack a unit that isn't the, the one that's being meleeed um, and they'd attack. So, like, oh, God, I have to quickly paint. Someone's probably going to remember what I'm talking about. Where, like, if you had your Lombos all here and uh, they brought in units like this. These two units are attacking each other. It used to be that the Lombo would melee attack the the green unit here if you use these units to attack this green unit. 
But then they changed it so that that doesn't even happen anymore. So they 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 just always do range attacks, which um, not sure if I ever was a fan of that. But uh, be interesting to see with those kind of UI changes. Duplicate weapons are now combined into one and shown the number of times it re repeats for better clarity. Okay. Uh, we improved the garrison UI to ensure that we, when selecting a garrison building, you can see both the buildings. Informate. Ah, that's actually very nice. So it used to be a big problem, like you couldn't. If someone garrisoned, I think like they technically could hide info from you. Like I know from a castle perspective, it was very hard to remember what the damage was on like a TC if someone garrisoned it. But I'm pretty sure like you could, as a player, by garrisoning your town center, you could hide whether you got range damage upgrades. So it was much more difficult for someone to make an informed dive into your base because they might be diving and be taking substantially more damage than they had expected in that situation. So this would be nice to be able to actually still see that info about the building. We're now just playing team members together in all front-end UI. It's about damn time we've done it, boys. Players can now bulk tribute to other players using the tribute menu. Okay, so nice convenient changes. Known issues. Okay. Uh, AI idle. Oh, dude, we're going to have fun with this one because I think we were planning to do some content on the, the pop maybe around the AI as we were messing around with the, the main game version and the AI is... Uh, it's a clown show, to be honest. It's way too easy to exploit. So idle fishing ships on Black Forest. Okay. Who plays Black Forest, though? Lamal, we will have life. AI uh, pauses constructions on landmarks. If it's the English, it makes sense, guys. We've been over this before. English have to take a coffee break every 15 minutes. So that's just that's simply just laws. Um, Mongol AI freezes in Nomad. Players start on the same island during Nomad. Hardest Malian AI sometimes ceases production. AI may ignore some enemy units after large scale conflict and some daily. Okay, so whatever. No, nothing like nothing too drastic there. <laughs> Let's talk about the landmark reworks. So big changes. We've taken a hard look at the landmark designs and changed some dramatically. Don't worry, your favorite like the uh, Golden Gate landmark untouched. Why? Actually, in fairness, I'm kind of okay with this. So we can all agree that the Golden Gate is like go tier. It's just the go to. You always build it. The logic here is very clearly one of like. Instead of nerfing stuff, buff stuff, which I'm always a fan of. I actually hate it when people call for nerfs on things instead of thinking of maybe a way that things can be buffed. The reason is that whenever you nerf something, you're essentially alienating someone who really likes that, right? So let's say you've got someone who only plays Marlians. If our go-to solution is to immediately say everything Marlians do has to be nerfed right now, look at their, their win rates, you're potentially just driving players away from the game, not towards the game. The people that are sick of Marlians probably already gone. Maybe they don't even come back. But now you may drive away the people that love Marlins because now they're trashed it. Whereas instead, if you say, okay, let's buff like the Ruse, let's buff like the French, all these type of things, you bring them up to more on par with Marlins. And what you end up doing is you you don't alienate the Marlin camp that love that Civ, but then you also satisfy the other camps because their Civs are all of a sudden relevant again. Um, obviously, there are some situations where nerfs have to happen. When something is just drastically OP, you have to address it. But I do not like it when nerfing is the go-to first response to a problem. Because it and I know there's a risk whenever you go buffs where you get what we call power creep, right? You just keep buffing something up until the whole game just gets absurd and it feels like one click destroys everything. Um, but like it takes you so long to get there, and I don't think AOE falls at risk of arriving there quickly. Um I definitely think there should be some Marlin tweaks here, but I hope there's nothing too drastic and it's more the low performance sieves are just getting big buffs. Making the tribute system change. Yeah, it's quite nice. You don't have to break your arm anymore. Um, surprised there was nothing in there about the Mongols being able to trade stones. So I'm going to assume that's intended because I know some players in the 3v3 tournament were questioning whether that was considered an exploit or not. Now, for those unaware, Mongols, while they can't sell the stone themselves, they could tribute stone to other players on their team. Okay, so let's move in. Hardest AI... Oh, come on, dude. This is like the worst way to balance AI ever. Dude, this is like genuinely the most lazy approach to AI balancing, and I hate it every time I see it. So we were doing some tests with the hardest AI, and how to put it? It's like it put his head into an oven for a few hours. The AI is very easy to manipulate. AI will always be easy to manipulate. But if your go-to solution is this, the hardest AI now receives a two times resource gathering bonus. 
it's bad. Um, because this won't actually affect the the underlying things that I can do to AI. Like where I can just basically manipulate its behavior to not go for resources or whatever. But it now will just make anyone trying to not cheese AI have a crap game. I have always, always been against giving bonus resources to AIs. And the sad reality is that this is actually a standard that exists and has for a long time in game development because AI systems tend to get the, the butt of the um, the resources from the production side, right? So graphics get prioritized, gameplay mechanics get prioritized, netcode gets prioritized. A lot of things get prioritized ahead of AI. And thus, like at the end of the day, the budget in terms of like, you know, performance hit, like, what, what can we actually allow the AI to do tends to be lower on the rungs than, than so many other things. So usually your job as an AI developer is to create an illusion of someone being smart, right? Anytime you've ever called AI smart, I want you to realize it's not. Game AI is never smart. It's all stupid. It's always stupid. It's always manipulated, manipulatable because the way that you are shipping this product, if you had AI that was self-sufficient, learning, reacted like truly in a, a human type way, you need a supercomputer running those scenarios. It's just not feasible. So instead, if you are an AI programmer, and I kind of know a few things about this. Like my whole dissertation was in AI and pathfinding solutions. So I'm a bit of a nerd for that. Your goal is to make people think it's smart, but it's not. Um, sadly, one popular way of making AI seem smart or hard, a challenge, whatever, is exactly this. Sadly, it's more apparent when it gets done. Like it's more annoying when it gets done in games like this compared to FPSs. For those who don't know, there's like a great example of this with Halo. I'll tell you a quick story about Halo 2. So Halo 2 came out um, and was renowned for being an absolutely amazing game. But early in development, they had very big issues with their test groups. Their test groups said the game was way too easy. It was boring. They didn't enjoy it. And the developers, they said, okay, we'll, we'll try to fix this. We'll try to sort this before the next test group. So a few weeks passed by and they're racking their brains. Like, we, we tried all these different scenarios. We can't get the AI to, like, to be more challenging, to be more interesting. The AI just seems too easy to manipulate for people. That was the complaint is that the bots weren't fun. So they're about like, you know, a few days out from the next test. Like, what do we do? How do we make the AI challenging? And they're like, oh, screw it. We have to change something. Um, increase the damage and increase the health. That's what they've done. That's literally what they've done. End of the test, the same guy who said it was too easy comes up and goes, wow, what have you done really worked? Like, huh? Like, yeah, that was really challenging. The AI really like, like, you know, the, the game really made it a lot harder for me. I really had a lot of fun with that. Key example of how that system works, why it works. It's such a trivial system, but there's a reason why devs fall back to it time and time again. That's because there's a long history of proof that this kind of crap works. Think about games that you've played, FPSs that you play, because I think FPSs are some of the most obvious ones for it, where you have to shoot something five extra times in the head and it's seen as harder. In some ways, yeah, because you have to keep clicking the head, right? And it might be hard, but recall, whatever. Um, but I do think, in my opinion, those games compared to these, it's so much worse when this is your go-to solution. Like with FPSs, some go too far. I still remember Operation Raccoon City where I called it Bullet Sponge Central and the hardest difficulty. But I think this, there's something that makes you feel cheated as a player and I think the best way I can describe it is when an FPS says this unit has more health and you have to shoot it more times, it's very clear and apparent to you that you have to shoot it more times because I'm shooting it. When I as a player come in and your solution is to give more resources and crap to an AI, I don't understand. Because here's one of my big issues, folks. Like AI should be a really good way for people to train to face off against players. Now, Beastie is a really good player. I just opened Photoshop again. I hate how I always click this button by accident. Beastie's a really good player. But Beastie, if you ever face him, is not going to have two times resources. He might earn two times resources by doing things, but he's not just going to be given it. This is a bad, bad way of trying to teach people how to play the game. I am very much against this. I hope that this is a huge stopgap and is going to be removed as soon as possible. Um, it, it, it's just a bad, bad way of approaching this. All right, hardest AI military production tuned to start earlier than before to allow the AI to make earlier uh, attacks earlier. That's the type of thing you want to have happen, right? And by the way, let me combine these two to explain like the, the lazy knock-on effect. This now, if they ever change this, this won't work 
Because now, if they ever change this, the AI is going to build units earlier on at the cost of economy. You see the issue here, right? So when you... Th this is a very big issue where when you start putting on band-aids immediately like this, removing those band-aids later is a lot more work. It's a compounded effect with AI. You know, removing one thing rarely fixes everything. Uh, it's problematic. Easy AI will now build fewer defensive structures and will raid less. <laughs> Wait, what? So hold on a sec. People like easy AI is way too hard. And everyone's like, hardest AI is, is a pussy. <laughs> mm. Wow. So AI early resource gatherings have been adjusted. Reduce the preference for early stone. Yeah, that's kind of fine. Um, Increase wood gathering preference. Well, transition to feudal makes sense. Marlene AI starting economy tuned to prefer to gather more wood to afford an open pit mine. Makes sense. Just the AI for producing anti-building CG units to improve uh, AI's production of rams. Okay, that's kind of nice. That fits as well with the changes because uh, there are some cool changes coming with the rams. I think we're going to skip the, like not going too much detail with the rest of AI because I think we spent a lot of time on the AI. Um, I don't think there's anything else. There's a few things around wonder logic and they've adjusted the AI's logic for producing fishing boats to lower the priority when the AI has a stronger need for naval military, which makes a lot of sense. Oh, this is really good. We tested this. They fixed a bug where the AI would allow its villagers to fight back against enemy harassment that would still end up not being in its own favor. This was a very big issue, by the way, with um, the Delhi. Delhi, especially because the, the Delhi AI would always get textiles. And if they get textiles, essentially what the AI is doing is it's calculating whether it's a viable fight to take. And if your unit has 50% more health, it's calculating it as a more desirable fight than without. And um, we saw this exploitation very clearly when we would run a knight, a French knight, into like 10 Delhi villages and they'd fight, which is a really bad fight. For anyone who hasn't done that before, go do it. You'll see exactly why you don't want to do it. Um, so glad they got that change because I think that's like, that was one of the most easily exploited ones I'd seen in the whole thing. Dude, there's more AI? <laughs> Fixed villages har harvesting sheep that are following a scout. <laughs> I hadn't seen that one. That one's brilliant. Multiple AI fishing ships can now gather from the same deposit. Okay, nice. Uh, AI now researches military upgrades more effectively. Drop the films they have constructed. Uh, now always try to build the first lumber yard near a forest. I do find that's a very good use. Although not realistic, you know, come on guys. Uh, AI early game economy was optimized to improve its wood gathering while transitioning to feudal. Yeah, already, wait, you already said that above. Okay. Uh, adjusted the AI to have trebuchets to be high priority during castle age and lower in imperial. I don't think trebs need to be that high priority. If you actually look at the way a lot of players are playing AoE 4, unless there's clearly a complete stagnation of gameplay, they don't rush trebuchets. They weren't gathering resources? Okay, yeah, this is a lot. I think we've covered AI. We'll move on there. We've we've actually covered AI enough at this point. Um, I think we kind of got our point across in the early phases that... that at the core of it, despite all these changes, now that you've lumped in this stupidity of handicaps, um, you've created a compounding effect whenever you go to change AI further in that's going to require you to go back to this point in the AI development arc to fix it. So the 2x is like a very big problem. I hope whatever the next iteration of the AI is, they essentially balance it and it doesn't involve the 2x at all. Because so I think if they start balancing AI again and again and again with the 2x system in there for the hardest AI... It's going to cause so many issues when you finally try to remove 2x a year or two down the line. Yeah, it's the same as anything else in the development cycle. If you add a crap ton of stuff to the system and then you remove something that was core to it at the beginning, you're going to break everything. Okay, so without AI now, because I think, I think a lot of people want me to read about the things that are going to apply to them facing players. Some people on your ladders might seem like bots, but you know, now they'll seem less like the bots because they're not getting two times resources. Uh, we changed the name of Mediterranean map to Baltic. Not surprised, considering you have a biome called Mediterranean. Thumbs up. I don't know who originally made that choice, but Mediterranean or Mediterranean was quite an interesting thing to say as a caster. Maps are now alphabetically ordered. Nice. Biomes now alphabetically ordered. Nice. I mean, these are just logical things. Made some map quality of life improvements. Cliffs should not generate at corners and block sacred sites. Yep. That. I, I think I said about this already, that sacred sites should always be a priority in generation over any other detail in generation. So it's kind of weird that they weren't already. 
Hills should not generate near shore. Ah, now this... So this would make more sense why they only just added four lakes. I remember they set up here, they added four lakes. People were like, oh, please, God, don't scroll up. Um, the reason they wouldn't have added four lakes before, because one big issue with it was exactly this. If you guys recall, a lot of times people just couldn't place a dock because there were these hills that looked like they shouldn't be blocking at all. They were essentially blocking like 70% of the land mass around a lake. So that's probably why we didn't have four lakes earlier. And carcasses will no longer drop through bridges. Did we, we don't have any maps of bridges. So, but, you know, prepping for, I guess. Didn't that one catch out Viper? Yes, Mark, you're correct. I talked to Viper. Um, he genuinely got confused on the map selection. That was the game where we were really confused as casters because he called out like super early that the game was over. In fairness, it kind of was, but I think it was like eight or nine minutes in he GG'd on Boulder Bay because it was Boulder Bay on Mediterranean. <laughs> Which is so dumb. Um, fix the soft lock that would occur. Load the screen is cool. So specific map changes. Fixed a rare instance where one or more trade posts would fail to generate. I don't... I maybe seen that once. But fair dues. Then again, who cares? I'll just remove Altai. Uh, Prairie. Players are pushed ever so slightly further apart from each other and close to the edge of the map. Interesting. I kind of actually like that players were slightly closer, but I... Uh, so so here's the thing. This change would make sense if it somehow slightly crippled cavalry-based sieves. But it actually does the opposite, and it makes aggressive cavalry sieves stronger. Because now there's more distance to cover, so it's harder to kind of react without cavalry your own, right? On the aggressive or the defensive. Um, one thing it should ideally alter are the Mongols. So Mongol players are now going to have to run further to reach your base with their spearmen play early on, which means you're more likely to get what you need off the gold vein before they block you out. If you're closer to the corner, maybe easy to wall though? I don't think so. Uh, so the issue snores is that the prairie wood lines are not consistently generated in a way that can guarantee you walling efficiently. It's very rare actually. I think the only sieve I've seen that can kind of get away with very, very early walls is probably the Chinese. I'm talking like in general. There are some map generations where you'll spawn as HRE play and you're like, praise be to the holy regnets because I will actually get at this game because I can wall myself in and get all my wooden food. But like in a lot of cases, it's just not feasible. Um, a perfect example of like a game that shouldn't be that feasible to wall, but was, I think if you look back at Magic versus Lucifron in Red Bull Wallo on Prairie, he is the Chinese, was able to build a lot of walls and create all these these block off points to stop raids. Any other Civ in the game, minus Delhi, probably couldn't get away with that. Mountain clearing. Uh, the resource. <laughs> Why is this map still in the game, dude? The resources surrounding the players are now more spread out and don't clump as much. The amount of forest on the map has decreased, creating more space and allowing players flanking. Uh, players are moved slightly further away from each other. Okay, so I actually reached out to one of the map creators and I gave a huge suggestion on how to actually make this a good map. And my suggestion was the mountain clearing. Uh, so let's quickly just do a paint to show you what mountain clearing is right now. So mountain clearing right now is... I have Photoshop, by the way, but I just use paint because people love paint. This is mountain clearing right now. You know, you've got the gray representing the mountains, and then you've got the players, and the green is the forest. It just surrounds you. It's a huge, huge crap load around you. This is bad. This is just fundamentally... Like, it's, it's forced players together, and your, like, options... Dude, it's like playing a mo. It's the difference between playing a mobile on a PC and playing on a mobile. The map's just so much smaller. So like your your flanking possibilities are so short. The infantry actually is the bargain tool. You don't really need cavalry. Um, here's the solution I suggested. You can still have your mountains. That's fine. But what you're gonna have is stealth forest on the outskirts, and then you'll have blobs of hardwood trees about and you can move and if you remember guys the way mountain clearing works is if you ever get past the wood line there is a thin passage behind the wood lines well this will now give you access to that that passage so now as a player who wants to flank with say cavalry you can go wide and you have that access from the get-go that's the suggestion i made the only problem from my understanding, is the way they've created the map tools, it can be very difficult to get stealth forest to consistently spawn around these um, these, these kind of clump trees. 
So unfortunately, if we ever want to get mount clearing to be good like this, because I think this is 10 times better than mount clearing is current context, they would need to rehaul the map design tools. But in my opinion, they need to do that anyway. There are far too many weird interactions between balls, sacred sites, and all these kind of things. Part of that's to do with the priority code, though. Um, it just feels like it's very difficult to get good maps when the tools throw up so many hiccups, shall we say, when they, they generate. Looks like a pizza. Exactly. This is pizza clearing, dude. Unlike mountain clearing, I want to clear this. <laughs> okay. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on from that. I think we've given our feedback on that. This will still be a chalked map, in my opinion. Uh, general fixes. Who cares about campaign? Lamal. I already done the tutorial. Is there anything in here that really matters? I don't think so. There's just general stuff. Ooh, that's kind of cool, actually. That's very big for Mega Random Nomad. Uh, so when you're eliminated from a match, remaining units will stop attacking previous targets. Villages will stop gathering and any other units' commands will also cease. It's actually a very big deal because uh, I've seen plenty of games where like in Mega Random Nomad, someone beats a player next to them early on and then they run out of wood because for the last 30 minutes, dead players' villages have been pillaging his wood lines. So that's actually a really nice change. I'm glad of that. Um, also, by the way, another cool thing, this might actually make it harder for people to wall convert a dead player's economy um, because they won't necessarily, like, you can't just wait for them to all cluster together. They might be more spread out. Okay, so I think that was the only one here. The rest is just kind of like trivial stuff. Okay, uh, fixed a bug where melee units couldn't attack on broken wall segments and would stand idle. Really? I did not know that. Landmarks could remain standing if destroyed while under construction. Wait, what? Uh, fixed fishing ships temporarily stopping when they are reordered to garrison in a dock. It's like just smoother. Uh, influence based. Yes, yes. Influence based effects such as the ones from the Abbas, the Abbas's House of Wisdom and the Holy Roman Empire's emergency repair influence can now only be extended with fully constructed buildings. We've done it. We've d some people on the ladders are about to crash and burn in the rankings. I'm not going to name and shame, but I've seen a few that have been exploiting that crap, especially the HRE to this day. It's just as big for the Abbasis, by the way, because imagine an Abbasid player builds a town center away from the primary TC, and you're like, I'm just going to torch this down. Burn, burn, burn. If they just if they put some blueprints of houses to connect in, they get five fire armor. Five fire armor is absurd. If you're up against a feudal age opponent, I believe that removes um, not 50% of the damage. I think they do 12 torch damage, if I recall correctly, for feudal. So you're removing 5 of 12 damage. That's an insane amount of damage being removed from your siege attempts. It was so stupid. I'm glad they've done that. Yeah, HRE main is definitely on notice because the HRE is the, the big scumbag for it because, of course, E repairs. But the Abbasis, like, very situationally, could benefit just for, as much from this. Um, glad to see that gone. I don't think I've seen any Abbasid players exploiting this, which I was very surprised by. That this is exploitable if you go for a greedy TC. Fix an issue where units sometimes spawn on the wrong side of a unit production building. Okay, that's good. I like that. Hopefully they've changed it so that you can choose where you garrison units out of now. Maybe make some more sexy TC uh, like plays. Maybe punish people if they only bring like you know melee units to a TC siege. Relics will now stay on top of bridges and walls. Cool. Wait, what? Wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me it was possible to walk up onto a wall with a relic, die on the wall, and then it would fall through the wall? <laughs> oh, that's so brilliant. <laughs> you just have like an aggro wall. You're like, well, I'm not getting this relic back to base, but you can't have it back either. Just plop and it just drops through. Oh, that's so annoying. I'm glad they fixed that. Relics respawn on the nearest land after being lost in the ocean on the transport. What were they doing? Wait. I don't think I've ever seen someone lose a transfer ship of relics. Were they just actually dying and being lost before? <laughs> That's crazy if so. Glad of that change. Change the event cycle behavior to now only focus on attack notifications. Although you're still going to get screwed by outpost rushes. Uh, elite army tactics, heavy maces, and two-handed weapons, extra damage now properly applied to charge and spear wall weapons. Yeah, that's actually weird. I, I don't think I'd ever glance that, but... Now that I think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Elite Army Tactics is the main one for Spear Wolves there, right? So that means if you braced, you weren't getting bonus damage on your initial impact shot on units charging you. Um, yeah, that's a pretty reasonable change. 
I don't think I can't think of anything that matters that much for the Chargers. But yeah, this is mainly so basically this is mainly an imperial age change. It's where they mention heavy maces and way. Oh, so they so basically this is an outright buff the HRE because that means that the HRE wasn't getting the bonus damage from heavy maces or two handed applied if they ran into a knight. Is what that's saying, which. Is pretty insane, actually. So HRE just got a lot more violent, guys. Like, think of those times where you ran a knight in and you, you managed to, like, get away in time. You're not going to get away anymore. Like, if you got away on, like, less than half HP, now you're going to die. Because from the way I'm reading this, the HRE in their first strike with the heavy maces, which add plus six heavy damage, that wasn't there. Two-handed weapons and extra two damage wasn't there. So instead of doing... Uh, 20 damage to you per, in, on the first strike, they were doing 12 per unit, which is a substantial amount of DPS lost there. So this is going to make HRE a lot more effective at blocking night raids, even with men at arms. Other units will now do a better job of finding good targets to attack. This is especially improved when raiding farms as units will now continue to hunt farms instead of touch, the torching farms. Very good change. I, lo I love it when more A, a click is the solution. Um... Kind of has to be due to the kind of sluggish response time on the tick rates uh, for this game and just how hard the hitboxes are to click sometimes. Sadly, the game has to be more A click oriented than very specifically clicking on things. Although Garrison ability can now be rebound to a different hotkey. Glad to see that. Yo, uh, Relic, if you're watching this, I was playing your company here with free beta. And uh, speaking of things that need a rebind, how about retreat and reverse aren't on the same goddamn hotkey? Check out the VODs if you want to see what I'm talking about. That crap was insane. After repairing a farm or resource drop-off, villagers now uh, automatically gather from the farm or nearby resources. Just a reasonable change. Um, to be honest, if you need to do anything else, you, you choose it too, right? I think it's better to have that default behavior than the alternative. When provoked... No! Sorry, guys. I had to get that off my chest. I've heard about this everywhere, and, the, and reading it is actually telling me as well. When provoked, Ball will now seek revenge on their attacker and ignore nearby innocents. Well, consider you just nerf Ball, developer. Are you technically not the attacker of the Ball? All right. So uh, Pumba might want to get himself a first-class flight over to Canada and do something about these developers messing with his aggro patterns, because I'm outraged. This change is just bad. So... My thought process, I tried to like look at it from their perspective, and my thought process is that the ball players, I'd say, were down over what they were before. But I don't think ball players were down just because of the ball aggro. I think ball players were down because trade is up. And if you're playing for trade, you're not going to go out into mid map to play ball as well. So inherently, the issue with why balls are not as prevalent with like TC drops and everything else they used to be is because, well, one, you drop you, the TC drops got nerfed directly. But two, more people are interested in trade now than they are in going into the mid-map for ball. If you're going trade, you're probably not going to mid-map. You're actually going behind your base more often than not. And that's why you're seeing less ball play. This change is them attempting to get more people to go for ball now because, well, for a start, someone can't screw you over when you're going for a ball. If you remember, some players would, uh, with the old system, they'd attack the ball and keep dragging it away. So you couldn't actually get it. But guess what? You just brought that system kind of back, right? That, that's going to be returning here. So that, that cheesy element has returned. I think ball play is going to be harder now. Um, on top of that, obviously, the more obvious ramification of this is now, you know, when you run an archer army near a ball early on and someone attacks that, that ball, you don't get punished. I don't like that. I personally think if you are choosing to run your archer mass to, next to the ball, that's what I call poor positioning and you should be punished for it. Just very weird to see this change. Um, the only justifiable reason I can think of is it was a bit silly that someone, let's say you built buildings near a ball, someone could aggro a ball and the ball would destroy your buildings. I remember seeing that against a Malian player before. Um, that's the only justifiable reason. Everything else that I mentioned, like this change is a negative and just shouldn't happen. It's, 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 this ball change is just dumb. This guy's going deep analysis. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marine Lord likes to keep it simple. He's like, this is shit. I'm trying to go a little bit deeper here. What's up, M Lord? Hope you're doing well. Of course, Marine Lord would be in here when we're talking about the ball. I'm not going <laughs> to reference why, but <laughs> he came at the right time. Like, for real. It, Relic, if you find this, change it back. This change is just hands down bad. Um, 
I'm trying to think of like a better way if you really want to change the ball, what you should do. Like if you if you want people to actually play onto the ball, you need to improve what the ball offers or you need to alter what trade offers. That's why people aren't going for ball right now. So that means you can either increase the food you can get from a ball or you can increase the gathering rate. I don't like either of them because that leaves Delhi, Abbasids, and the Ottomans with their junk in their hands while the other kids are out having fun. So like, you need to do... What could you do? You can make the ball do less damage if you really want to go that way. But like, for real, I, I don't think you should... This this is just not the way. I don't know, man. Let's not bore, uh, let ball sieves capture it and put armor on. True, that's the solution. We should be able to um, we should be able to herd Marine Lord's mum, mount her in the appropriate way, and then charge into battle wearing her. Kind of like a, a oh like a dwarf, like a dwarf ball rider. There you go. We've done it, guys. Um, but yes, relic, change this. Fishing boat gather rates. Deep water fish have been reduced. And roofs have been reduced even more. Like that change as well. Shoreline fish increased. Interesting change. So this change, I mean, this is mainly Mongolian Heights, more so than any other map. But the the whole ramifications of these changes, like the reason they're making this change is we all know how snowboardy water maps are. And now this is creating more of a, a tier system on how bad the game's going for you. Before it was like <laughs> dunking on these kids oh crap uh he's stomping on my, my my balls i'm done i'm out right like those are the two options now they're like in between it's like well he's put his high heels on but he hasn't stomped you just yet that's what this shoreline fish change is about in conjunction with the deep water fish is it's meant to give a softer reset so that by taking water and winning there you will still inherently over time get a bigger like uh, a bigger gain right you'll be able to snowball ahead but the timing is delayed. It doesn't feel like the game is over by 14 minutes as much as their goal here. Because now, let's say I'm starting to lose water, I might fall back to shoreline fish. So I'm getting worse gathering rates than deep water fish. Usually in those situations, the panic sets in and you realize you're on the clock to get back out as fast as possible. Now, although you want to get back out because deep water fish are better than shoreline, you get a little bit more time to build up your, your solution to coming back right like maybe you now have the extra breathing room to build three or four archer ships extra before you come out to get deep water back so that i think is the big reason behind these changes um notice there's been no change to villages gathering around the shoreline fish but to be honest shoreline fish being gathered at one for villages was already good enough you don't need to inflate that further all this means is that all around whether it's fishing boats or villages shoreline fish are going to be more sustainable as you try to make your backup attempt to get on water, right? So don't expect this to increase naval games by much, but you will likely see players trying to come back onto water one more time before calling GG in a tournament. All right, walls. People's favorite thing. We love walls, don't we, guys? Everyone everyone love their walls right now? You know, you're a big fan? You guys love getting into a game and watching someone build stone walls in Fuel Age? I love that experience. Such a great change. Please tell me that they've made them cast late now. They haven't, have they? Uh, pass eight walls. Cost increase from five to seven. What? Fifteen wood. Dookie, dookie, dookie. Go, 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 go. Yo, what up, Joe Bear? Thank you for the sub. Welcome back to the swamp. If anyone was watching right now and they'd want to make sure they didn't miss my waffling, make sure you sub to the channel because if you sub to the channel, you don't have to get intruded upon by stupid ads that come out of nowhere and recommend to you to go play StarCraft 2 or whatever the hell is trying to get you to do. So it's 15 wood compared to now, whoopsie, where were we? Seven. And these have, oh, wow. Um, so this is like good for, for Roost players because now four or five Palisades are just slightly better value. They take longer to build, yes. But it's 15 wood compared to seven. So around double. But now you have 3,000 health instead of... Okay, ignore what I said. <laughs> Oh my god, I have done a purge patch review. I was about to do it. I was about to go on a full tandem and then read the next line. 
Uh, this will happen a few times. So, wow. Okay, Ru yeah, Roos is still buffed though. Like, the build time difference is, is huge here. So Roos had this really big issue with playing defensive. Like I actually genuinely think playing Roos defensive was very difficult in the current patch because of the build times of your power save walls. It takes way too long to build. So I'm glad they made this change considering how weak Roos feel right now. Um, the cost increase I'm kind of okay with. I think walls should be an investment and they should be a prioritized investment. Like it shouldn't just feel like nonchalant that you do it. Um, considering they didn't increase the build speed, or the, the, the reduce the, the build time. No, increase the build time, rather. This is still kind of okay. Some people are not going to like this, but my thought process is like, defensive play should be earned. It shouldn't just be given. And this means that playing out onto the map should be more encouraged, which I've always been a bigger fan of. And there were two ways they could go about this. They could even make mid-map resources even better, or they could make a change to walls. The problem in an asymmetrical game like AB4 is changing something like what you get from a boar or what you get from a sacred site heavily impacts certain sieves and not others. Wolves, on the other hand, are a cross the board, everyone has access to them type building, right? So altering Palisades uh, to force maybe people to be more present in the early game is a better approach than saying, Boar now has 3,000 food, or sacred sites now give 200 gold, right? Or um, there's like this crazy wood line in the center that has ancient oak woods that give you double the wood. So monks now only heal at fifth. Oh, the stone walls are well, actually stone walls. So I've said this before, and I say it again. I actually think stone walls should be like closer to two k HP. I think it's kind of weird how hard it is to get through a stone wall, especially when people build them on the flanks. Because if people build stone walls on the flanks, your only go-to solution is a ram, a ram that will only do four hundred damage per strike against what is still a three thousand HP structure. Um, and also, if you if you equate the cost difference between a ram and a stone wall piece, and you think about what your ram can do afterwards, like stone walls are just, they're, they're still way too good. The problem that you have is like, if you don't bring a ram or a siege weapon onto the flanks, you can't get for the stone walls. So I think even with this change, there's still a drastic issue in that stone walls on the flanks are too good and cost effective. Stone walls in the center, if you have a condensed fight, bad. But let's say you're up against a sieve that just wants to do cavalry raids, for example, stone walls are stupidly effective. Because if you want to like go up and get a raid, you have to wheel up a siege weapon all the way, and it gives a very long time for someone to react to that play. We'll go get the ram buffs. Okay, we'll get to them. Don't worry. Monks now only heal at 50% speed with their target. Okay, so there was one or two ways they could have went with this change. I was actually a big fan of the idea of a mana system, so you can't infinitely heal. And I think that would have actually, I think like if you went for a mana system, you could have actually even increased the heal rate and it becomes like a selective thing. Um, but instead they just went for the infinite heals, but a 50% rate. What's going to matter to me here is how they define in combat. So I'll have to test it, but if in combat means when you're attacking, that kind of makes sense. If it doesn't, then I think it's, I think range meta is going to become heavier for the deli because the deli, like think about here, right? Like if, if I start massing loads of archers and they get become injured, I can still attack with them. They get healed at full rate. So I hope the way they've coded this is that if I or something is attacking me, I am in combat. Uh, if it's one or the other, I think it's very exploitable. We already mentioned the way that you can be in combat with and potentially still get that heal, right? Let's say I'm not being attacked. I'm not taking health damage. It might not register in combat. That's trivial. And that's very exploitable for like archer units. On the flip side, if it's that I need to be attacking, but I can be attacked, that's incredibly exploitable for effective HP-based units. So think tanky things that you would just use as blockers in the early game. Like, let's say, you know, you're using spears, uh, but you're just running them back and forth, and they were just, like, keeping your opponent at bay. You could circle jerk heal them, right? With just one or two scholars, and they wouldn't die. So my theory is this should be both ways, in that it's if you're attacking or being attacked. Yo, what's up, Winston? That's how uh, that is how it works. Nice. Okay, so that works correctly then. All right. Thank you for the clarity. That's good to hear. Yeah, then that that should work quite well. Uh, this is gonna be a heavy, heavy hit to the deli. Interestingly enough, this is gonna be a heavy buff to the Ottomans. So Ottoman players have been pivoting into the imams recently, 
uh, which I believe is one Vizier point. You spawn two Imams, and they have a passive heal of one HP, as well as the default heal of eight HP targeted. If I'm not mistaken, the way the numbers are stored in AoE4, and I'm sure Winston can kind of clarify on this, I'm not sure if it rounds up slash down or if it can actually have decimal points. I'm leaning decimal points because I've seen units with zero HP, but I haven't seen it recently, so they may have altered that. If they did alter it so it has to be rounded numbers, that would mean that you can't actually, you, you can't change the Imam's AoE heal. It's either zero or one. So it would have to be one, right? Um, there are decimals, yeah. So, okay, so this should in theory nerf the Imams for the Ottomans then. That's, okay, that's, that's, so that's reasonable. I think most like boxes have been ticked then. Uh, I'm trying to think who the biggest benefactors are of this. I think Mongols. Mongols actually... So here's the interesting thing for you guys. Mongols, especially more than any other Civ, this in combination with the change to uh, Spearman, increasing the Dark Age damage from 6 to 7, means that actually now uh, Mongols should be able to pull off Spearman rushes against HRE, which they're already still kind of trying to do, and more importantly, Delhi. Because Delhi, remember, they couldn't be you couldn't do it because they just get their shivs out of their villages, stab you down, and then have a scholar healing. Now, with a 50% reduced uh, like healing rate, you might not kill the villages, but you'll be able to push them off and get outposts up. So I'm expecting to see an uptick in Mongol players against Delhi. Ah, okay. Thank you for the clarity, Waffles. So back to my point. I was right. Yay! It doesn't happen often, but Ottomans are even uh, better then. The Ottomans are the biggest buff sieve from this change. So that one HP AOE heal is going to actually be pretty substantial. Uh, I actually think like Ottomans are now better off against Delhi than they were before, which is a little bit worrisome for Delhi players, I think. Because I think a good Ottoman player can actually keep pace well with a Delhi player. I would still give a slight edge to Delhi, but like the games that I've watched so far, I always watch Ottomans win those. But I think that's because Delhi players were still getting used to Ottos. But this this should be a big buff in that matchup for Ottomans. Thank you. Villager formation catch up speed reduced. This is a big one. From 100% to 40%. From big to baby level. Really substantial change here. Uh, a really important one. I think I'm not the only person who's got sick and tired of seeing someone make a kick-ass raid and get rewarded with one villager. Um, this was all because the formation shuffle. Like you could basically get your... You could, more or less like they're dancing on ice, weave your villagers back to safety from a dangerous position. So this is now like risk reward association. I do think that there's still a very big issue with hitboxes though that I hope Relic are looking into because it's extremely easy to run your villagers past knights. In fact, I've watched like 10 plus knights in a choke point backstab and the villagers just walk past them. I don't think it should be that easy for villagers to just go through units. Um, so this is step one, but I think there should be a second step to punishing these villages out in dangerous places. You shouldn't just be able to get away that easily when you're out in no man's land, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, this will most definitely have an impact on pocket eco sieves. And the logic here is that basically if I'm playing out my base, there should be a bigger vulnerability point for doing so. Whereas before, if I played out the deer, for example, I could very easily get back to base. There's even ways you can manipulate villager formation behavior by selecting units on say your deer stack and then your home wood line. And they would try to like reconvene together. And that meant that the deer villagers would catch up towards the midpoint between them and the wood very quickly. So this change will help alleviate some of the stupidity of that behavior. Um, and yeah, we can see the movement speed. Ah, that's actually very nice. So we're going to know when units are having formation shuffles with increased movement speed. This is a really important change as it's very confusing for players when they can't see. You can now see the stats of all weapons equipped instead of just currently wielded. Actually, am I writing that, Winston? Am I reading that correctly? Like, so for example, if you formation shuffle, am I now going to see the real speed of the unit? I'm hoping so. Uh, we'll keep reading on in the meantime. I just need to actually message someone about. So I'm just quickly messaging to say food later so we can cover this. Not even sure if the formation catch-up shows up as movement speed increase. Okay, uh, my feedback on the, the dev side really need, I think it does need to. 
Uh, it's it's like it's really important feedback info, right? Like if I'm chasing and I've got infantry, say chasing, I want to know if it's even feasible to catch. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time. Um, so just a little heads up. I think that would be a really, really good improvement. Um, maybe the way to show this as well would be you'd have movement speed and then you'd have brackets plus so that it can indicate if they are at that moment moving faster. Uh, fix an issue where the secondary UI panel isn't accessible when selecting a group of mixed unit types. Okay, nice little handy thing. Villages build menu now correctly resets when clearing the selection. Mm -hmm. Cal not dying when the U monster cheat is used. I'm glad you guys saw to that, that huge oversight. It's very important that my cheats work correctly. Uh, would incorrectly tell you to repair an enemy's landmark. Wait, what? <laughs> I've never seen that one. Uh, fix villages restarting the build animation after reissuing the same build command. Like that change. I, as a per I'm sure I'm not the only one. I click a lot. If anyone has watched the terrible gameplay that I've played sometimes, or used to watch play Dota 2, my APM is very high because I'm a type player. Um, so that kind of change really benefits me a lot. Fixed villages looking like they're gliding if spammed with a tackle just to hunt a... Dude, I missed... No, come on! Okay, this, this is the flavor of life stuff I don't want removed. All right, let's move on into Siege, though. Wow, big changes for Siege. So field constructor Siege units no longer get stuck in... <laughs> hey, they're not stuck. They're just concealed. It's like when you hide a car so you know when you come back, no one's stolen it. <laughs> Interesting choice to make wood reductions across the board. Great bombard, bombard, cannon. Yo, what's up, missips? Thank you for the sub, man. Hello Welcome there. back to Swarm. Hello there. Yeah, that, that's exactly what the ram hide in the bush is like. It's just the Obi-Wan moment. Hello there. <laughs> My building three. Uh, so everything would reduce. These siege weapons were feeling too expensive considering how quick they get killed by anti-siege and melee units. I can kind of see that. I would say, like, Maybe reducing gold makes more sense than wood, though. Because my take is that wood is a more limited resource than gold on the newer maps. Obviously, it's not across the board. There's still a lot of maps where wood, there's a lot more wood. But let's say I'm playing Prairie. I'd rather have additional wood than gold because gold is everywhere, right? Um, it depends on the overarching direction, though. If more maps coming out go back to the old format of a lot of wood, not as much gold, then this change is like, really good. Um, or really bad, rather. But if they go to like more maps like Prairie or Gorge, for example, then this change is maybe a little bit awkward. Maybe it would be good, like a good balance point would be both, wood and gold. It feels so good to gather gold when massing armies, and wood not so much. What are you on about, dude? <laughs> if you want to win the highest level, you just want wood. More wood, more game. Um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I, I, I don't know if that's going to drastically change the feeling around the siege, just because like I said, like I don't think wood is usually the issue. Like if you're playing Lipany, Dry Arabia, The Pit, King of the Hill, um, French Pass, like loads of these maps, then, then like you're not really worried about running out of wood. It's gold that's usually a strained factor. Um, I'd say Riboldi, even you could afford wood plus gold productions. Because the, so the, the main perspective is that for Riboldiquins, these are very hard to utilize correctly because they have to be so close to the battle. Cannons and bombards, like, it's a more winning unit, right? Like, if I'm winning, I, you're not reaching it. A Reboldequin, even if I'm, like, misplaying, like, I, even, even if, like, uh, I'm, I'm holding, I can still lose the Reboldies e easier, right? It's not about running out of wood, but more about the eco macro. But my point is, like, even, it's not just the eco macro. I think it's, like, what is available long term. So if I'm starting to run out of wood, I have to be like, oh man, this bombard's harder to justify. Same to gold. You're, if you look back at most games of A before you play, you're more likely to run out of gold. I'd say 80 plus percent of the time, you're going to run out of gold before you run out of wood. Actually 90% of the time, right? Uh, historically across the game. Obviously Prairie existing a lot now, maybe it changes a bit. Um, but let's move forward from this. It's, it's like, it's it's nice. I'd say some of these are underutilized. Like cannons come out in small abundances and, and that's fine. The Ribaldi definitely needed something to work for it. Glad the Culverin didn't get buffed because I think the Culverin just, Culverin plus Springles do exactly what they need. Um, so Ribaldiquin, but this Ribaldiquin change to me, I generally think you could probably change the gold cost as well and it wouldn't be too ridiculous. The only reason they probably didn't want to do both right now is that you are talking about a unit that only certain civs can build. Um, do I think this will be a, this will bring Reboldequin back into gameplay? 
No. I I think outside of choke point maps, um, Reboticon's going to be very hard to utilize. So unless there's a drastic change to the way cavalry form, uh, like you know, forms in, in these games, I don't think Reboldi can work. Reboldi is really good against like men at arm spam and spear spam. Uh, outside that, not so much. Reboldi Quinn smashes though. It smashes the one out of 100 times you see it get to smash. The other times it's getting smashed. Bang, ram changes though. And that point there, they still want gold to constrain, uh, but just make it cheaper. So uh, the last thing I'm going to say on that, that point to just like kind of address that. I genuinely think that that Woods is a very big issue in AoE 4. I think Woods leads to stagnant late games because it's too easy to fall back onto trivial resource types that feel infinite like Horseman Spearman, which are funded by Wood. So anything that just allows you to stretch Wood even further, I personally don't think is like good. Um, I think... and. Maybe like I can get a little bit insight in the design choice with some of the new maps. I think there is a a feeling from the development side of that as well, and that's why you're seeing maps designed with maybe a little bit less wood now. Like Prairie comes to mind, Gorge comes to mind. A, a, a perfect map example is where you're seeing interesting games develop in the midpoint and late game, while feasible, is less guaranteed. Because when you have a lot of wood, you have natural defense lines, but then you also turn that defense line into what is a scalable resource in late game. And that, like, what I mean by that is I mean what you're doing with it, it scales effectively. Late game, building spears and horsemen in mass is actually very effective. And we've seen it for several months now, how good it can be. Like the only food wood unit that really falls off are archers. The rest stay pretty relevant. Okay, Baron Rams. Siege workshops can now produce batting ramps for all civil... Okay, I like this change. I actually like this change a lot. Um, it's really awkward when you desperately need a ram, but you need to fight. Like, when you... when you <laughs> Think about this, these times where someone's, like, dropped a wall in your ass, or they're dropping, like, keeps, and you're like, I really wish I had some rams. You don't want to have to stand there with your army when your army should maybe be fighting. So this is a really cool, cool change. New technology, lightweight beams. Imperial Age Tech. This is good, actually, because I remember talking to a few AOE2 pros. I haven't even read it yet, but like the fact that we're getting a buff for Imp Age Rams is good um, because they talked to me about Siege Rams, and I remember kind of like nodding my head and going, man, I wish that kind of thing existed for us. Increases Rams attack speed by 40% and reduces their field construction time by 50. That's pretty cool. So there's still going to be some situational usage to add Rams to your format when you're on the go, and this is to encourage it because one big issue right now that exists... Um, is they wanted rams to be relevant in the late game, but they only cost uh, by making them only cost one pop cap, and of course you have so much wood like we talked about. But they took too long to build. If you think about late game, late game is just this constant slog where we're pushing units and pushing units and pushing units. If you then think about how long it would take you to build a ram, if you're building a ram, your units aren't actively involved in the push. So reducing the time by fifty percent was actually a really smart play. I would have liked to have seen something the improved Ram's resistance against Springholds. To me, it's still quite easy with a Springhold or a Culverin to end Ram's, um, which feels weird. So I don't think there's an easy solution to that. For those that don't know, Springholds do... No, dude, Springholds do a lot against Ram's. Am I misrecalling or are Ram's actually classified as Siege? Do, 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 tags, type siege. They're type siege. Why are you on about Springles do nothing? Springles do a lot. They do like 50 damage. Yeah, 50 damage and a ram has like 420 HP. That's not nothing. That's quite a lot. So do 30. The 30 is pierce, which will be reduced, right? So the ranged armor is enough to reduce it. They do 70 damage, guys. 70 damage. Way more than five shots? I don't think so. If it is, it's bugged. So, like, here's my thought process. You can say it takes three shots to do a mango, but hear me out. Rams have to get close. Rams are inherently going to be exposed, whereas mangoes might not. So, like, my thought process was, like, Springholds maybe should take very long to kill rams. Like, it shouldn't even be five or six shots. Like, it should be ten plus. Um, because rams are meant to be, like, a CQ really tough like commitment 
So they should last a very long time. Um, and of course, Culverins will kill even faster, right? Because Culverins have higher uh, attack bonus. I'm pretty sure this spring takes about 15 to 20 seconds, I think. One spring, will do, yeah, one spring to kill one ram taking 15 to 20 seconds is not long, in my opinion. Like if the, especially when you consider the investment, like I'm, you're paying double what I am, but your spring wound isn't a risk and my ram could die. Um, so my take on this, and it would require them changing the the way the the base the the bottom of the siege damage works, is that I don't think you need to reduce spring wound's siege damage, but you need rams to have like a different classification. Maybe I don't know if that complicates it, but like. The problem right now is that if you have additional armor, from what I understand, bonus damage always goes through the armor. I might be wrong on that. I talked to one of the devs and we like, he wasn't sure either because there's no instances where this would be testable. But what I'm talking about, for example, is if a ram had 50 pierce armor, in this situation, at least by the classifications, the spring would still do 70 damage or 71. Uh, because the pierce would be reduced to one and then 70 would chunk through. So I think a cool change could be if Rams had like 50 armor, but the way this would calculate is pierce would be reduced to one and then you chunk uh, another 20 damage off the siege bonus that Spring get. Um, that I think would take some time though, because I think the way they've coded the core system like wouldn't make that easy. Anyway, let's move on. I think this is an interesting change though, like just to highlight, like I think... Another cool thing to keep in mind, someone that people often forget. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Cities something. I can't remember what it's called. Um, can anyone remember the name of the tech? There's a unique tech and I've forgotten the name of it. It is Siege Crew, Wandering Town. Wandering Town, that's it. So this is going to be very interesting for these guys because remember, this increases the damage by 100%. So I actually think Roos late game could be pretty spicy. I'm getting ahead of myself. Why did I have a feeling something's happened there? All right, yeah, we'll continue down. Yeah, but this is the way, like I said, we're doing purge style patch notes. This is the way it works. I spend 20 minutes analyzing something and then it immediately just gets made pointless. <laughs> All right, let's move. Let's do it. Let's go. Cha-ching. So into the Abbasids. I glanced these before, and I I had a feeling that archers are going to be the new meta. Let's see if it's confirmed, though, if we read them in more detail. House of Wisdom Landmark. This building is now a home market destination that can be traded. <laughs> uh, how, how did we walk out of the current patch going... We need more trade. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was? They were like, Mongols have had their fun. Malians have had their fun. You know who needs their fun? The little Abbasids over there. Give them a little bit of fun. Winky, winky. Oh, man. Uh, that was the only... No, no that was not, that's not the only change to trade. Trade Wing now spawns free traders once construction is complete. Are you guys ready for Feudal Age Trade Wing? <laughs> uh, I actually think that this... Mm. So we were casting a game earlier and we saw Feudal Age Trade Wing work really well for uh, Crackety. And admittedly, it was because it didn't get scoured. This is going to put so much more emphasis. These changes, like I haven't even read the rest, but I can already tell you this is going to be a lot more emphasis on scouting and identifying trade uh, the, the wing choices from house of wisdom as the opponent you have to spot it now it's really important the reason it's important is this is going to have a similar impact to what mongol silver tree does for those that don't understand what the mongol silver tree build is usually about we understand it when it's just mass trade but there's actually a very solid build that involves rushing castleage and what it is is you build two traders straight away maybe two more you do one long trade and then stop and the whole logic is that your opponent has to react to the play as if you are doing something other than rushing Castle Age, that you are planning to build more trade because it's so strong they have to block it out. Their time investing resources to block that allows you to get a very free Castle Age timing ahead of them and come over the top. This will have a similar effect because what this is, this is a better version of what I just described, right? 
Because now you are just instantly getting free traders to start trading. You don't even pay for them. You pay the upgrade cost, sure, but you have them. If I'm not mistaken, it being a home market destination, I hope this doesn't mean that it can also build traders because that will break the game quite a bit. Because that would mean on tech up, I will immediately be able to build an extra two or three traders if need be and bish bash bosh. So I'm hoping at least this this is not build. Because if you can build as well, this is like, this to me is a better silver tree. Long term, you know, you can argue silver tree kind of holds up well with certain other buffs around castle age. But I'm talking the initial influx for a fast castle type build sort of situation. Very strong. Moving on though, military wings spawns units based on the age you complete this wing. So, so no one's doing it in feudal age is what I'm reading. <laughs> One archer and two spearmen is like, mm. okay, thank you, Winston. So it doesn't train traders. It's just a spot to return gold. Even that being said, I think getting free traders on some of these maps is going to be broken. Like if you have certain maps where you spawn pivoted towards a corner, like I think actually wetlands can be quite good for this because usually you're like, you might spawn um, two thirds away from the, the the neutral marketplace. This could be a very strong opening. And yes, I like, like this could yes stuff. This could be to stop the the Mongol Tower rush. But if you're up against the Mongol Tower rush, you just open with either you either go just accept you're going feudal and build archery range anyway, or you go spearman yourself. I don't think that this is value. Um, one archer, two spearmen. But anything more might be a little bit too strong. Two camel riders in castle is decent. And three hand cannoneers in imperial is I. But at that point, like three hand cannoneers. Uh, dude, this feels like a worse version of being an Ottoman player and spawning your one off Janissaries. I think the situational usage of, of military wing around unit spawn at start of age is going to be castle here for the camel riders. I don't imagine hand cannon is being that good because it's too late for free to be great. And, and this feels like it's really flimsy. I, I The only reason I can see people going military wing here is because you really want boot camp. It's more about boot camp than these units spawning. But from a design standpoint, this makes sense because I would say military wing probably feels weakest in castle age and feels better at the other... like the other two in terms of like the advantage you get right it's but th to be honest like while well the tech that you get in castle age isn't that impressive the, the military wing because it's the extra armor for camera riders right um the thing that is really like good still is if you go castle age military wing you're still then getting access to the boot camp before it which is useful so a lot of the military wing builds will probably if they appear involve military wing castle and yes, I agree. Two camel riders do have more value than the free hand cannon is. It's the timing of the game, even the resource comparison. Like it's it's always better for two camel riders. Camel rider shields move to stables. But I believe it's still going to be locked behind this or can anyone get it now? Oh. Okay, yeah. I, I don't just stand by what I just said about Castle Age military wing being the way you do it now. I take my stamp of approval and jam it on my forehead. Composite bows has been moved to this wing in the castle age. Cost reduced from 700 gold, 300 wood to 350 good, uh, good gold, 150 wood. So 50% discount and you get it an age earlier. That's nuts. Just to remind people what composite bows does. I believe it's a 33% uh, or 35% decrease in the attack speed. Sorry, 25%. Reload time uh, of arches by 25%. That's really good. I honestly think the new build is going to be mass arches in Abbasid's. So uh, in, in Abbasid Castle Age. So I think Abbasid's new, like the new popular build is likely to build, uh, like to be Castle Age play. So you probably go trade. I haven't read the other two, so maybe I'll change my mind. But I still, I, I think this is hard to beat. Castle Age is your peak point and you build arches and spearmen. Because arches that reduce attack speed, um, it doesn't make them like Chuganu level, but they can kind of handle armored units reasonably well. And the cool thing is by going archers instead of crossbows with the savings you have from, let's say you build, like, let's say you build 20 archers instead of 20 crossbows. You've saved 800 resources. That's a Maga now, right? So you see where this is going. So I think Abbasids are actually going to play back into 
uh, like spear archer mass, and then you can go for mangoes. Alternatively, like someone's mentioned camel riders. I don't think like camel riders necessarily, but the idea of like you are now saving uh, more resources, adding in archers could allow you to go for camel riders because you know you don't have to build a more premium unit because camel because uh, normal archers remain more competitive than they otherwise would. Um, I'm pretty sure it was just archers that it affected, right? It's not camel archers. I always forget because I never see composite bows. Uh, let's have a look. Yeah, just archers. Dude, if it was camel archers, it would be broken. Yeah, no, camel archers would be broken, guys. Let's let's not let's get ahead of ourselves. Let's uh, move on to eco wing. So they added fertile crescent technology. Costs twenty five food and seventy five gold. Reduces wood and stone cost of economic buildings and houses by twenty five. Whoa. So now your TCs are going to be 25% cheaper, but they moved fresh foodstuffs to town centers. And they reduced the bonus from 50% to 35%, which brings it in line with the Chinese. Oh, sorry, no, that's production. In terms of like production, no, ignore me, I'm being an idiot. It's not in production rate, sorry, it's um cost. But the cost, yeah, ignore me, I was being an idiot there. My brain was going the wrong way. Um, But it's a one-off, right? So the fresh food stuffs, I assume it's, the research is there now, but it's a one-off. That's overall a buff, I think, like, So, Fertile Crescent technology should take 30 seconds to research. I think this is a buff to 3 TCs, but enough to 2 TCs. Because if you do 2 TCs, you probably have enough time to build straight away. So, you won't get the reduction in cost. But once you go 3 TCs, like, it's different. 3 TCs or 4 TCs, like, this is a buff. 2 TC build, I think this is a slight nerf. And uh, we'll have like the detail we'll have to see is if you need to research this one each. I would assume this is a one-off research thing. And if it is a one-off research thing, I don't know if you can get this in tier one or not. If you get it in tier one, this is actually a buff. I think like overall this feels better. If it's tier two, slight nerf to what I think are the better Abbasid builds, a uh, slight buff to the weaker Abbasid builds, which involve three or four TCs. And someone's uh Miss Miss Merlin, you went and checked. So spring one versus RAM, it takes one spring with nine shots, so 35 seconds. But you're not really gonna have one spring, right? Like I'm thinking like you're gonna have three springles. I still kind of stand by what I said. I I actually think springles shouldn't be maybe even that impactful against RAMs. Ah, thank you, Winston Waffles. So it is feudal age, but you don't need the eco wing at all. So this this actually further supports what I'm saying with trade. I think trade, depending on the map, is still just much easier to pull off the multi TC builds. And this, like I said, is only really a clear buff or maybe a buff if you're going like three four TCs. Even then, like the fifteen percent lost on food savings maybe just makes this feel bad. Um, I think trade wing is going to go up in value now, unless culture wing can save us. So culture wing, preservation of knowledge bonus reduced from 30% to 20%. Really? But reduction now applies to age up costs. Okay. Does it, But it doesn't apply on the one I'm doing because obviously I need preservation of knowledge. That is big, but I don't know if it's big enough to beat trade wing. I think fast castle abbasids is maybe still better with trade wing. So, 1,800 resources. Let's do the maths on this. So you go for culture wing, you get your hands on uh, preservation knowledge, which is gonna be 175 resource sync. So you're sinking 175 resources. Um, whoopsie, where will we at? So 175 resources there. But you're saving 20% on a tech up, which is 1,800 resources. So 360. So really, your net savings are uh, 205 for that tech up time. 
So 205 resources versus me getting three traders doing two thirds of the map on a trade, maybe returning like 90 gold each. I think trade wing is still better and lasts longer. Right, because like that, that's going to be a one-off on your tech. Because like we can talk about that benefit in Imperial Age, but realistically, like the, the take on this is feudal to Castle Age, so eighteen hundred resources. So eighteen hundred resources. After the cost of getting it, I'm saving just over two hundred resources. Alternatively, I get free traders that are probably going to return about. Eight, I'm going to say eighty resources. Let's say like I think eighty resources in a lot of games is feasible from a neutral trade post. Um, that's still. 240 resources and I maybe get more. And there's a knock-on effect that when I do this play, it forces my opponent to react to it and I still probably get the first trade through for free. So they've reacted, they're further behind. So then the net difference between their castle age timing and mine should be even bigger than if I went for the culture wing. Does that make sense? I think that makes sense, right? They did at least reduce the research time from 60 to 30, which I think is a big deal. I think people are going to start with this culture wing build, but I'm expecting them to move over to the trade wing build. I think trade wing will come out ahead. It's map dependent, right? Like if you don't have a good trade route, sure. Like this, this is the culture wing is the more stable, but let's say I'm playing like wetlands is the one I keep going to at the moment. Um, or I'm playing like, French pass, these type of maps. I actually think Trade Wing is going to be better. Even maybe Prairie, it depends on the spawns. Prairie is kind of like unpredictable sometimes, though. Anytime you go Culture Wing to age up is 30 seconds? No. Wait, what? What are you know about? It's age up costs. It's, it's costs. No, this is the tech. So just to clarify for people, culture wing, this preservation of knowledge thing, th I think this is meant to have another dot in. Because remember, the, the time it takes you to tech up is a minute and 45 seconds by default. So just to, there's a fair point that someone raised there. This should probably be another decil, like this should be another dent in. This research time change is applying to preservation of knowledge, not to culture wing. That would be broken. So this is just improving preservation knowledge. I st still stand by what I said, though. I think the, the meta is going to start off with culture wing at the core of it, and people are going to pivot to trade wing after a while and realize it's better. Um, but this culture wing will definitely start as the opener. It'll probably be culture wing into military wing is going to be the strongest. Um, but after a bit of dabbling, I think people are going to discover, uh, discover trade wing into military wing is going to be better. Uh, preservation knowledge is not already at 30 seconds. It's 60 seconds. Insane, Shepard. 60 seconds right now. So that is applying to that. I don't think they're making a change to um, the other ones. So let's move on. Fix a bug where Golden Age wasn't reducing research times properly. Interesting. Well, well, well. Good. Yeah, there we go. For the casters. House of Wisdom now displays additional build menu and caster mode. Good job, my boys. Faith technology. Faith renamed to... I hate you, Waffles. I, I, I can... like it's. I, I don't know which of you done it. It's one of the casters over at Forgotten Empires that came up with this choice of word. Proselytization? Proselytization? I think that's correct. That sounded correct. Proselytization? Proselytization. Proselytization. That was American. So proselytization. Proselytization. Which sounds a little bit like prostitution if you say it too quickly. Uh, proselytization. Monk convertibility that unlocks with it has been renamed to proselytize. But faith is still tech four, right? Yeah, this is the... So this is the real problem with, with proselytization. The, the problem has never been the name needed to change. Um... Faith into prostitution. Hey, man, there's the, the, there's non prostitutes. So I'm telling you. Okay. Uh, anyway, the issue with faith, I mean, this is guys. This is literally a trivial change. It doesn't change anything, unless there's details we don't know. It's just a name change. But I'm going to quickly address this. The problem with faith has always been that it's a tier four tech. It needs to be a tier three tech. Here's why. Faith 
or prostitution or prostitution, if you're dyslexic, um, is always going to be problematic because while it sounds cool having the ability to convert units without needing a relic, in theory, it doesn't play out very well because what ends up happening is if you have to wait until Imperial Age to get this, typically when you're an Imperial Age, especially as an Abbasid player, you're pop capped. If you're pop capped, as we all know, you can't get more than your pop cap. So converting a unit simply kills it. So you've built these 150 gold imams to kill a unit. Could you just build something that actually kills a unit? This has always been the core issue with proselytization. See, I'm already prepping for this new name. If they want proselytization to like be decent, I think it actually has to be a castle age deck. Um, it, it just... Like, how often are you going to need imams in, in the late game? I just don't think it works. Like, e even from, like, a healing perspective, like, if you argue mass imams, I, I disagree. Because I think Abbasid, because of their production rates, their play in the late game isn't to mass healing. Their play is to just mass buildings and build new units. Because they can build quicker than practically any sieve in the game in the late game with Golden Age increases, right? So once you get Golden Age free, you get the extra 20% production speed, you just zoom them out. So, like, that's always been the issue. If they want to ever make an, the Imam conversion play relevant, I think it has to happen in Castle Age. Uh, so, what's chat saying to that? Because I think that's maybe controversial for some people. The issue is that it's clunky to use. I don't think it's just that it's clunky to use. I think it's, it's genuinely, like, I've talked to multiple pro players about this, and their answers have always been the same. Like, it's literally, you, you, you're pop capped. And I'm not, like, I'm not saying, oh, I'm not going to name them because, like, I don't know. They can they can talk for themselves in the chat. I don't know if they are, um, but like I think I think I asked like five different players that are in the top fifty, and they all had the same statement they gave me. It, it's legit. You just don't have a use for it, right? I think this comes back to another bigger issue, which is that you know the conversions as the game goes on. If you do a clutch conversion, it should pay. Like pay dividends, you feel good. But because if you're pop caps, you get nothing for it. Conversions become less relevant. Conversions should be like a super weapon that remains relevant as the game goes on, and they don't function that way right now. So in my opinion, like you know, you could go the way of changing faith to be tier three, and that maybe breaks the game a little because single conversions, when people are only getting initial cast players units out, could completely cripple them. My alternative take is just make a system where you can go over the pop cap limit with conversion based units. And there's loads of different ways you can do this. Whether it's permanent, which they probably don't want to do because performance issues, or let's say temporarily for 30 to 60 seconds, any units over the pop cap that came from the conversion, they live, they do things, and then they die. And before anyone goes, that's OP. You've got 250 pop cap versus my 200. It should be OP if you let me wallalol convert 50 of your units, right? That you should be punished appropriately for that. In the late game, those units just dying doesn't really punish when you're just perma-pushing units. Chinese. Well, that's easy. <laughs> Astronomical clock tower. Yo, they got clock tower batting rams. I look forward to people taking, what was it, 15 shots now to kill a ram with their spring order. <laughs> oh, blimey. When are they going to fix the goddamn flags in the caster mode? Wait, what's wrong with the flags? Uh, fix the bug where granaries wouldn't generate taxes when technologies were researched there. Interesting. That one wouldn't change too much, but it's a nice little thing. Um, wait, they did they stop generating tax altogether? If so, that's a big deal. If it was just like one off, whoop de do. Do you have a flag? Who needs a flag, dude? Just no. The right hand flag is always the wrong way around. <laughs> from your perspective, from my perspective, the left hand flag is the wrong way around. And let's see, Nesibis will finish its current volley if, if its target dies or moves out of range. I like that because you used to have that fizzle thing, right? Where they just cancel straight away. I think you still manually cancel them, but it was really annoying when you start firing and it was like, what? So glad they fixed that. That's all the changes China gets. Sorry, Drongo. Actually, no, Drongo's probably happy doing cartwheels right now. Just chant, chew, you get it, chew. <laughs> all right, let's move on to Delhi. Delhi, whoa, oh, baby. All right, we've got kind of another bastard situation on our hands, I think. Compound the Defender Landmark contains the following defensive technologies that ignore age requirement. Village Fortresses, that's big, actually. That's actually really big. So it used to be like Delhi kind of like, 
kind of had to end the game fast, right? Because like I, you never really saw village fortresses. It wasn't the the goal of the keeps wasn't that. It was to control the sacred sites and win. This is actually a really big change. Um, so this might give more of a ceiling to Delhi. I don't know if they really need it though. Like they get all these texts. Damn. Okay, that's insane. Now you because the other thing is remember you tech up, then you'd have to get your six hundred stone, and then you'd have to build the keep. So if you think about the difference in timings now, like. It went from five minutes to three minutes 45. You're going to be about two and a half minutes by the time your keep is complete. This is a huge buff to compound the defender. House of Learning. Uh, reinforced foundations technology allows villagers and infantry to garrison in houses and fire garrison arrow. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, okay. No, in fairness, they're different land. Could you imagine if, there was, if this was like a different landmark and you got compound the defender? So you're just, you zerg villagers. You do like the 200 villagers strat of the Abbasids, but instead of building outposts in your opponent's base, you just build houses. <laughs> this is kind of interesting though. From a defensive standpoint, this is similar to Chinese villagers, but you actually return fire. So in some ways, it's actually even better. Um, kind of cool to actually see that they've buffed the other techs because we all know that you build House of Learning for one thing and one thing only, and it's home blades. Looks like they're actually trying to make everything else relevant. So Tranquil Venue, uh, technology healing per second increase from one to two. I believe that's around a mosque you heal. That's a nice boost, a uh, really helpful one actually, especially if you're playing totally type gameplay, which I think if you go like House of Learning now, if you look at a lot of these changes, at least these two so far, they're clearly targeting turtle, uh, turtle style gameplay from Delhi. Uh, keep in mind also, when you go for like aggressive keep drops in locations, like maybe on sacred sites, it's not uncommon to then drop uh, a, a mosque behind so you can get the Wi-Fi tech to get all these upgrades that you, you can see up here. So now you're going to have the added benefit of essentially having medical centers. Although I think medical centers, if I recall correctly, is a higher number. No, it's exactly the same. Okay, so <laughs> so folks, uh, this is basically Delhi getting medical centers in, in a kind of off the cuff way. Whoops, I keep losing which one I'm on. Because of like how you're going to play that, right? Like a lot of the time, if you know the game's going long, you're playing kind of turtle of House of Learning, you are going to drop a keep, you are going to build a mosque behind it. So you are going to have that heal on the offensive. Kind of a cool change. Lookout Tower's technology now adds one weapon range to outposts. Interesting. I don't think this one's going to be too absurd. Um, maybe with the cannons, but like, I mean, dude, if, if you're in late game Imperial and you're building can uh, cannons as Delhi, like, good on you, bud. You deserve it. And hearty rations technology moved from Imperial Age to Castle Age, which I believe... Was that the one with the extra gathering? Yeah, because I most of can't remember what the hell this was. So, uh, ah, this is one that increases the carry capacity of villages by five. These are really good changes. Um, in some ways. I think Delhi are still ridiculously strong. They're already really good. And you could argue it's kind of silly to give them buffs. My thought process is that while it can be a bit silly, the good side of this is that House of Learning was merely just something you built for ha for Home Blades. Literally no other reason. This now gives it more breadth. I think that's good. There's probably going to have to be other things taken away. And I think from the developer's side, nerfing the healing while in combat is already ticking that box to them. So they now feel better about fleshing out the rest of this instead of it just being House of Learning or as it should be better known, Hone Blades. Um, now they don't feel absurd about it because you know we've nerfed Delhi the hardest with the healing changes. Hisar Academy uh, acts as a madrasa and food generation increased by 20%. I like that. I think that's, um, that's actually better. It's quite a nice change. Pass the Sultan... Now trains the new unique Sultan's Elite Tower Elephant, a mount elephant with two hand cannons. <laughs> Damn, dude. We're going like... <laughs> it's like American levels of guns and overkill right now. A mounted elephant with gunners on top. Hell yes. While activated, the pass of the Sultan will train an elephant every 200 seconds. And of course, you can garrison to decrease it down to 90. Delhi got some choices to make in Imperial now. I think these are both really good. It depends on your comp. If you're never really burning your army, I think Pass of the Sultan is just going to be the, the goad. 
Um, if you're going for like an unlimited push strat where you just like funnel unit, 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 like spearmen, men at arms, whatever, then I think the, the Hissar Academy is going to be the way to go. Um, War Elephants have been buffed. What in the deuce? Okay, the health has been reduced. So cost has been decreased by quite a lot, actually. So they've taken a 250 off the cost of them. But their health has gone from 1,400 to 850. Spears are still going to count you, but everything else you should be able to run through. Tusk damage has been increased. Spear damage has been increased. So these guys have been turned into more glass cannony roll, which is interesting. Uh, this means that the Delhi no longer really have elephants as a, a frontline tank. Like 850 health, how could you say that's not a tank? Hear me out. Like it used to be 1,400, right? The armor also got increased. So the logic behind these changes is they want to make Elephants better against generalist compositions, but still more countered by direct counters. I'm actually a very big fan of this change. I think if elephants are ever going to be meta, they need to be done so in a way where they don't just become like the backbone of everything, right? Like they they don't become, uh, un, un, I don't want to say uncountable, but they don't become like this nuisance to deal with, right? Delhi have this history of being an oppressive sieve that forces you to react to them. And while you react to them with, with this kind of change, um, the way you do it, you should get a lot of bang for buck. Similar to think, we used to run tower elephant spams and that stopped after they changed the unit to have effective HP against ranged attacks, but be vulnerable to melee. Now they're giving the same treatment to war elephants, but I'm really actually quite a big fan of what they've done here. Cause I think war elephants didn't really have much of a place in the, in the comps for Delhi because they just didn't do enough for what they cost, right? Now, while they are a little bit more vulnerable, they do substantially more. They have a, a decent amount of ranged armor to work with, which is always good to see. And they, they function a bit more like a, a pseudo siege unit now, right? Uh, they've gained plus damage up against the uh, the buildings. And tower elephants also gain as well. So yeah, this is... I quite like this change. You should be able to choose though with lesser training time, for example, versus Janissaries. Um, oh, you mean... Oh, sorry, guys. You were talking about someone else. Okay, I thought you were talking about this change. Yeah, so overall, this to me, I think is a good change for the, the Delhi's elephants. I don't think it's going to be the go-to build, but I think it's going to have some situational variants, um, especially when you consider that a ram costs you 300 wood and one of these elephants costs you 400 food, 350 gold, and they will do comparative damage to a ram to buildings at about the same attack speed. Sorry, yeah, 250 wood. Why do I keep saying 300 wood? It used to be 300, right? It used to be this is spa. I'm pretty sure. Like, I'm not imagining that, right? Yes, they did used to. My brain. Yes, it used to be. But still, like 250 wood for a ram that doesn't attack units and has substantially less health than an elephant. This like this has a situational place. I, I quite like this change for war elephants. Um, whether it's going to be good enough versus men at arm spam, because I still think if you go for the build-up, you're going House of Learning, you're definitely getting Hone Blades first. So if, if you go House of Learning, War Elephants might come in later on. And I think like the logic is that the War Elephants are kind of like a later timing. Maybe they're kind of the bridge gap between going between Castle and Imperial. Um, we'll see if they made any change to make Imperial more feasible here. Siege Elephants technology renamed to Howdars. Like, how do you do? <laughs> Not well, because I killed all your builds. Boom. Uh, in addition to equipment, tower offense with, with crossbows grants 30% HP? That's a lot. That's... That's an extra 180, right? Yeah. An extra 180. Wow. So that brings them up close to the health of a war elephant but they still cost the, the, the full amount, right? So in that way, it's kind of fair because it's still a thousand resource unit versus this unit that's now 750. But considering you get crossbows as well, I mean, that that's really strong. So I think the play might be late castle, you're playing into war elephants and then in Imperial, you're transitioning into tower elephants. Did I see the change above that to armored beast technology? Wait, well, you're right. I, I glanced past that one. Sorry, I, I just put these together for some reason. Now grants war elephants 25%. Okay, so I'm still going to stand by what I said that I think tower elephants will take the place of war elephants if the game goes on. But this is pretty strong. Armored 
Beast is tier four, if I'm not mistaken, though. Yeah. So I'm going to stand by what I said. I think the build is going to be layer and castle age, you play into war elephants, but then when you go imperial age, tower elephants are better because you're going to get the crossbows. You're going to be incredibly tanky, um, not quite as much as the war elephants. Maybe you see a few war elephants in there as kind of pseudo rams to kind of like saturate. Um, but the problem is if you go war elephants plus tower elephants, unless you are so milking the map, like you could never run out of resources, it's not going to be efficient in trades because it just encourages more spears. Um, one thing we do have to quickly glance over and, and emphasize here, by the way, is with the changes they're aiming at around these elephants, I keep mentioning spears as a counter. One thing that they need to be very careful of is, and I think we're going to see this, is that elephants aren't actually counted cleanly by all types of spears. What do I mean by this? Certain civs have an edge. HRE and Mongols definitely come to mind. Abbasids as well. Because Mongols have the Yam movement speed as well as the Maneuver Arrow. The HRE get the increased movement speed via Marching Thrills. And then, of course, when you look at the final one in, in that slew of, of civs... Um, wait, who did I say? I said HRE and Mongols. My brain is fired. Oh, yeah, Abbasids. They have the double spear. So when they're chasing, they have a second layer that's able to stab over. You can say English have attack speed buffs, so why don't I count them? That one's even harder, I think, to like maneuver correctly than maybe... Um, the Yam, because Yam can at least allow you to flank quicker. I also think Ottomans can be really substantial against Delhi with this, because remember, they're going to have the meta, that movement speed plus attack speed. There are certain civs that are inherently going to counter this a lot better. So I'm expecting if Delhi is seen as the go-to pick, of those civs I said, I think Ottomans are a really solid way of trying to counter Delhi play. Um, so maybe if someone's expecting Dry Arabia, Delhi, Ottomans match up quite well for a lot of the game, at least from the, the sample groups that I've seen. Um, something like HRE is a little bit different. You have to play for an early timing. Like I think if you arrive as HRE in a situation where your opponent has elephant masses, you're already too late in the game. Um, but just something to keep in mind is moving forward. Like certain certain comps, certain civs will benefit better from the spearman comp because of these different auras or movement speed buffs that they get. Also, one thing to keep in mind: it's been a long time since we've seen them in action. When the elephants return, they are going to have a harder time with spearmen because the changes to spearmen or changes to infantry in general. Remember, they decrease the distance before charging triggers, but they increase the distance that it continues for, the time it continues for. That means it's more likely that chasing spearmen will be able to get one or two stabs in before the elephants are able to disengage. Whereas before, you could kind of end up in this Benny Hills where like, you chase from a longer distance, but you wouldn't be able to get close enough. What this means ultimately in, in gameplay standards is that if you get caught out of position slightly, you're more likely to be punished. If you're really clutch in the way that you micro and min-max your distance, you'll be able to pick Spearman apart and they'll never get the charge off. So cool to see that in action. Um, can be a little bit finicky because someone that, I, you know, you got to keep in mind with AOE4 with the way the tick rate works, the way hitboxes work, sometimes microing accurately can be more difficult. But... It might be the, the difference maker between the great Delhi players and the greatest. Land snakes for marching drills. I would not build land snakes against uh, tower elephants. Because tower elephants, so the thing you got to keep in mind with tower elephants is I'm pretty sure the hitbox is bigger. It definitely looks bigger, or at least in a the formation they split more, uh, more further apart. So if you send a land snake in against, say, a spearman line, the cleave can hit like four spearmen, I think. Uh, if you send a land snake in against the elephants, they're going to hit one or two. If they're central to the elephant, they'll only hit one. If they're between the elephants, they'll hit two. So on top of that, you're sending in a glass cannon that can be kited and killed. Like massing spears is just better. It's more cost efficient. Um, and I believe the HRE has some changes. Maybe they get extra armor on the spears after checks. I, I remember glancing some changes around mine work. And yes, you aren't wrong, Darth. You have to have a lot of spears. Like, the, the, the point is you have to gap close. I think, like, high-level Mongol players will do well against Delhi because the whole idea is that you will time... You, you'll try to get outpost laid, and then you'll time your wrap with an, a maneuver arrow. And that's enough to completely screw them. Um, horsemen are still going to be a really good play, actually, in the comp. I think the, the way you can address elephants as other sieves that I haven't discussed here is you're going to build horsemen plus spearmen. This does mean war elephants are going to rip you a new one, though. 
But the whole logic behind horsemen is once you get to about 20 of them, you can body block elephants and stop them retreating. And a, a good player, will once he's body blocked, he'll open up the horseman formation on the side of the spearman approaching from and pull them past. And then the spearman will come over the top of the extra damage. All right, let's move on anyway. Uh, we spent a long time on the elephants, but it is a big thing to look forward to. Fix an issue where fishing ships would not benefit from range damage blacksmith upgrades. It's cool, but I'm going to say it. I've said it many times. I stand by it. Fishing boats probably should actually have the AOE archer shot that archer ships have. I don't know if that would be too strong, but you know, why else did the Delhi have this ranged attack if it wasn't meant to kind of be that? Um, maybe you need to, maybe the way is like you decrease their base damage, but give them the saturation. So let's say you put them down to four or five damage, but they do a small splash, probably would be better. Wait, my stream tile on the thumbnail stops it deep. <laughs> We, we come into it, guys. We come into it. Screw it. Uh, anyway, Zeal Technology now adds a gold glow to affected units. Wait, have they fixed it? Buff effect no longer stacks. Fixed a bug where buff was giving much less attack speed than... Okay. Zeal, Zeal be popping. Are we going to see it in action? Like, it's... It's imp all right, right? It's imp... How long does it take? <laughs> 1,450 seconds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gonna take a while to get that. I mean... It's a 50% attack speed buff. Like, late game, this now working correctly with elephants could be pretty baller. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think, um, I think, like, Delhi elephants might come back in. If you play Delhi elephant strats, you're playing to a later timing. Arguably, you might have missed your initial timing. Uh, because I think Delhi are, can, like, most situations looking to end the game sooner than mass elephants, right? Scholars which are garrisoned in a mosque will now have the automatic healing ability toggled on when leaving. Nice. Man, I just realized actually how far we got to go. <laughs> and I got to go eat food. I, to I told my partner to cook for half six and it's already like 15, 20 minutes through. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to tell her to put in the microwave because I think we're going to be a while. I mean, I don't know. Is the patch out yet? So you guys can go... Uh Play it? I don't think so. Let's keep going. So, geez, that's a lot of English changes. Abbey of King's Landmark now can crown a king, a cavalry leader, with a, le a lesser version of Abbey's aura. 300 resources. Only one king may be trained at a, at a time? Okay. Oh, no, 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 I misread that. I was like, yeah, of course, that's how all training works. They mean you can only ever have a maximum of one. Thank God. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine, like, one king has been trained. Another king is going to be trained. Also, it says at a time, so if I'm not mistaken, you can't even queue up another one. If you lose him, he has to be replaced from the start of the, the bar. He was nearby out of un uh, combat units for 2 HP every second. I kind of like this. Um, I think it's strong. So the reason I think this is strong is the same reason I think methods are strong. And it will depend on its health as well, but like it's too easy to keep cavalry units alive. So having him on horseback, if he moves at like heavy cavalry or horseman speed, I think this is going to be very exploitable. Um, but this isn't like far of an idea I had for Abbey of Kings where I wanted some sort of way of using a heal away from Abbey of Kings. Um, but this is the I mean, this is essentially buffing the English night time in Castle Age, if you think about it. Like now you can basically just play night raids with your king and you're essentially playing chivalry. That's pretty potent. And they've changed Council Hall. So Council Hall can now do all archery range units and technologies. Interesting. I like that. I think like English was sometimes struggling to make the crossbow switch. That helps them. English just got a lot more flexy, actually. Their builds just got empowered and they also have some flexibility now. I Yeah, I, I agree. I'd have to see the king stats. Like I hope this king is nowhere near the meta's health. Um, the way I do it with this king is he should scale based on age. He should basically be the Khan. So he should have low HP in early ages so he can actually be punished for being out of position and high HP in la later ages so he doesn't just instantly die to a cannonball. Which I know a king could die to a cannonball in real life, but I mean, maybe he couldn't. You don't know. He might be God King. Sorry, I had to weave out a little there. So yeah, hopefully this is a scale with age thing. If it's not a scale with age thing on everything he has, similar to Khan, there's going to be appropriate reads about this unit. Um, Council Hall change, like I said, it, it makes a lot of sense. King's Palace Landmark, they increase the HP. That's very generous. Wow. Full 5k? 
They must have buffed the white tower then. They have. Now trains, researches, and builds and placements 100% faster. That's actually really good. That's exactly what I would like to see from the white tower. Um, now it feels really good. So I would still say you don't go, like you're going to have builds where you want to go multi-TC before castle and you come back for the white tower and it's going to feel amazing. Because usually like you, you know, there are a lot of situations where you want a white tower because you get access to network of citadels. Um, also, English are probably bottom three in the game for transitioning to Siege. It's so difficult to do because you just don't want to build Siege workshops. Now, you can do that pretty effectively because remember, a castle can build any type of unit out of it. So I quite like this change. Um, I do feel like a lot of these changes are adding up to too much though for what is already a pretty damn good sieve. And these changes also allow this sieve to reach the later game easier and stronger. Ah, this is a problem. I don't actually see a downside in these changes to the English. I think they're benefiting a lot and not getting punished much. Let's see if it changes with the late game. Barkshire has been buffed on HP. Effect change from projectiles have 50% more range and double the amount of base arrows to all projectiles now have 15 tile range. I mean, that's still really good. Arrows from the Barkshire are now in Cinder and deal... Okay. So Barkshire basically got buffed because no one wanted it. That, that's, that's more or less like the take here. For those that don't understand, like Barkshire was not really seen as that desirable um, unless you got forced to do it. Usually if you saw someone building a Barkshire and it wasn't in the enemy's base, it was because they were paranoid or they were being pushed back. So it used to be like, a perfect, the, the best way you could ever see this was actually English mirrors. I used to say if someone had to build a Barkshire, it was GG. And I still stand by that. Because Wingard Palace offers so much. Um... This is this is these are decent buffs though. It's still gonna I still think it's gonna play as a stalemate unless Wingard's been changed substantially. So Wingard now produces four distinct armies. The Wingard army no longer trains a, each of the spearmen, men, arms, knight, longbow, trebuchet. Now trains two spearmen, two crossbows, and one treb. And the cost and train time unchanged. Okay, that's so you're getting less value then. Yeah, you're getting less value, I think. I think you're paying more and getting less. And yes, weird, you're right. It has longer range than a trap. I agree. Like the, I, I said, this is kind of insane. Um, Actually, this is really insane the more I think about it. Sorry, I have to come back to this because it's really important. Like, the 15 tower range now applying to everything, so sprinkles, cannons, everything. I mean, if it was just arrows, then it's good. Like, because trebs, right? Trebs can be tickled, but they're not going to die. I actually think this Barkshire change might be a little bit too good. And by a little bit, I mean it is hella too good. It's insanely too good. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 16 tower. But sorry. Yeah, you're right, Winston. Oh, I got bad on that. Um, but if you're a Mongol player, you're fooged. Correct? I'm right on that. If you're a Mongol player, you're in trouble. Like really big trouble. Because we did we already check we haven't checked Mongols yet, so maybe they've been saved. They need to ram it or nuke it with bombards, yeah. I mean yeah, but bombards can get clapped as well, is my point. Because bombards are gonna be in fifteen tower range. Uh I feel, yeah, I think Mongols are in trouble. <laughs> I actually really do think Mongols are in trouble on this. Now the rest is not too bad because Trebs. I still think it's gonna be really strong, because the thing to keep in mind here um is that the Berkshire can be repaired with wood, if I'm not mistaken. I think that might be the big issue that gets debated in the late game on this one. New Mongol Treb? That's true. I read about the Bao Bao, but if you don't get the Bao Bao, which I believe requires a landmark, we'll get to that one though. Let's finish up the English. Yeah, so so this is my big problem. Like This does too much for someone that costs wood to repair. <laughs> I actually think Barkshire, if you have a really good position on the map, like you're playing for Sacred Sight Victor or some crap like that, Barkshire might be the go-to now. Especially the the wing guard changes, um, like Trev is still nice, but this might offer someone. In some ways, it's good, but like in other ways, it's bad because they did. Like I said, I like buffs instead of nerfs, but like the way this has been buffed to be comparative is kind of nutty. Uh, let's move on there. Wing guard raiders still trains free horsemen, free knights, and they've changed the cost to be cheaper. Right? Wait, no, to be more. But yeah, they are quicker, but that 
I mean, they're quicker, but that change in cost is pretty high. I, I'm not sure people will build Wingard Raiders more than like once or twice at the beginning of Tier 4. I might be wrong though, but I don't think so. Still cheaper? It's still cheaper, but like, it's the opportunity cost, right? Like before, you know, I wasn't going to do it before because I'd be giving up like the siege units, but now it's like, I don't know, man. I think like when you get to that stage in the game, when you're that late into Imperial Age with the English economy, you've got such good eco that sure you're saving resources by doing this, but I'd rather save resources on traps. No? I feel like you'd rather save resources on traps. Cost is food. I mean, it's gold as well. It's double the gold what it was. My whole point, though, is like, from a cost efficiency standpoint, trebuchet is still better, right? Trebuchet is still better. I'm saving um, more gold on trebuchets, I'm pretty sure. Yep. AEO4 is what I was looking for. Yeah, so... Wait, I'm, I'm not saving that much more gold, I guess. It's 250 gold. I keep forgetting that. And there's 500 wood, yeah. But I am getting crossbows. Which, so if I need crossbows, like, this is just... I mean, obviously, there's two things at that point. But I still feel like Treb's pretty good. 200 gold for six cav is nothing. Yeah, but the... Like, I'm only getting three knights out of that. So I'm saving 100 gold. You can't treat that like I'm saving on the horseman. I don't pay gold for horsemen. What, are, what am I? Being conned? Maybe. Maybe, like I said, like I, I think if this is going to get done, it's going to get done at the beginning of Imperial Age. I don't think this is a long-term imp play. I think this is the type of play you make at the beginning of Imperial Age, and if it fails, you then go back to Wingard Army. Right? I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Unless there's someone else here. Rangers. Wait, you get Rangers? Hold on a sec. Okay, scrap it. We want unique units, boys. Wingard Rangers. I'm gonna and Wingard Footmen. I'm gonna have to see what these are. They better not be too good though, because English late games already good, really good. And yeah, they know that the previously the trebuchet overshadowed the others. So I will stand by the Wingard army is good. I still think this change that makes it good, cost effective, like choice, right? Because you're you're saving. 160, uh, then you're saving uh, 160 again. Wait, no, sorry, 240. So 400, and then... So it's 1150. Instead of paying 1150, you're paying 400, right? That's that's a really big saving. Um, comparison here, these are not necessarily like cost-efficient, right? Like in this situation, you're paying... So usually you'd be paying... Um, 480, 720 plus another 360. So you'd be paying 1080. So you're not really saving... Yeah, you, you, the, the bang for buck is still in Wingard Army, for sure. So it really comes down to how you're playing as an English player. If you're playing hard and fast, I see the value in Wingard Raiders, but you're paying a premium to do so compared to the Wingard Army approach. I can't comment on these two because we don't know what they do. Wingard Footmen and Wingard Rangers, like, I assume these are like elite Lombos. And these are going to be probably even more tanky men at arms or do more damage. Wingard Ranger is probably an eight tower range Ranger. That would be kind of nuts. That would be insanely nuts, especially with the way walls work. So I'm not sure about that one. Like what, 10 tower range? It's 10 tower. <laughs> I will see. Like I said, we'll have to comment on that one when we get hands on. Um, let's keep going through the notes in the meantime because we've still got a bunch to get through and I think the pop is now up. And I'm not going to hop on it right now because we're literally doing the patch notes. So we need to get through this first. Enclosure's gold generation increased from every 3.5 to every 5. Good change. Less gold, please. It's just so free. I mean, like the, the bang for buck, the value proposition with farms was way too high. Fixed a text bug. Um, so text is now 40%. And they reduced the values of network castles. This is a good change. The, 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 this is way too easy. Like, the, honestly, this is a really big change and it needed to happen. The attack speed aura made it impossible to efficiently exchange with an English army in 9 out of 10 situations. If you're doing the same thing, they just came out ahead. And it was very easy to gain ground and build new aura effects to continue winning. So this change, I think, is really good. I personally like the idea of moving away from a persistent aura into situationally activated attack speed buffs. 
of some kind, right? Like maybe you click on a tower and activate an attack speed. Yes, I know someone could build multiple uh, like towers to just trigger them one by one, but they have to build multiple towers then. I think like the consistent attack speed aura has and probably always will be a problem even at these values. At least at this point, I think the biggest problem I see with this change here is like... <laughs> Did, like we've already highlighted how absurd Ottoman's meta is. So unless they've nerfed the meta, this now makes the meta even better and the Ottoman's even better, which is kind of insane. Okay, so someone checked. Apparently, the Wingard ra Rangers have a nine tile range. Yeah, I'm not surprised they take 60 seconds. Nine tile range. I mean, I hope they don't have like an ambush either. If they have an ambush, like I'd expect a Ranger to, they're going to be broken. Could be a global ability. I don't think it should be a global ability. Um, because then if we do that, like Yam should be that way. But I'm saying like individual towers, right? Like the ring a ding the bell and it goes on cooldown for 60 seconds or some crap like that. And sure, you could build like let's say it lasts 10 seconds, you can build six towers to keep that up. But you now spent 600 wood. You spent 500 more than you would, for example. Okay. Um, Chamber of Commerce landmark has been changed for the French. No longer provides additional resources to traders. Automatically trades one free trader for each economic technology researched. That's interesting. I'm going to have to test if that is after it counts as well. So like if I am going up and I tech up and I've already got, let's say I've got forestry and I've got wheelbarrow. Do I get two traders or is it afterwards? If it's afterwards, I don't think it's good. If it's before, it's actually not bad. So think about this, like chamber of commerce you open with and you end up with, let's say I'm going to get forestry because forestry is dirt cheap. I'm going to get wheelbarrow. By the time I tech up, I'm immediately going to funnel out two traders from that landmark. And I can kind of do what we talked about with the Abbasids. I'm going to get free trade. Um, and with the French, you can choose what resource you return as well. So you have flexibility there. Do I think it's good enough? No. I don't think you can justify this over 20% global buff to cavalry production rates. I genuinely think School of Cavalry, like the only way this works is if you can get the School of Cavalry buff later on. So like my advice to Relic, the way you could do this is the buff that you get from School of Cavalry, make it a tech I can pay for in Imperial Age. I actually think that's the smart way of doing this so that it comes back around, right? So I think the game's going to go late enough. Chamber of Commerce makes sense. But even if I think the game's going to go late, and I'm going to get loads of eco researchers and get a bunch of free traders. This is not great because if my strength is in cavalry, which it is as the French, I'm, I'm essentially kneecapping myself by going chamber of commerce. Until that changes, I just don't see chamber of commerce being viable. Some people try to meme with it. They'll do some interesting builds. But when you get into competitive play, I'm, I'm going to put my foot down now and say school of cavalry is going to be king still. College of Artillery got some changes as well. Raw Artillery bonus damage increased. I don't mind that. Um, I think like French Imp is just basically Raw Knights and that's it. And the English King does scale with age. Thank you for the confirmation, Kamroth. That's a good choice then. I hope it's basically the same health values as the Khan. Um, I don't think you have to change it. Like you can basically just copy paste the values and it's good. So that's good to see at least. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, but this like the this change with this, the Royal Artillery, I like it. Um, can research gunpowder siege technologies. Works 50% faster. Unlocks the artillery shot ability on... Ooh, I like this. Loads the cannon for an artillery shot. Next shot has greatly increased area of effect, but no bonus damage against buildings. I don't know what the damage is going to be, but that could be big. So you basically can turn your bombards into mangonels. Also, keep in mind, they nerfed... Uh, they buffed rather um, bombards. They decreased their cost in wood. I don't know if that pr that actually applies to cannons, though, because it clearly said, if I remember correctly, I think it said bombards up here, not cannons. Let me double check. Okay, it says cannons as well. So, yeah, okay, this is good then. I actually think that's going to be legit. The only issue is going to be French players are still going to want to play mass knights, so you might not see the clear impact of it because, like, playing Siege is slower. But on static point maps and choke point maps, this could be really good. Like, let's say you're playing into something like, I don't know, let's say Boulder Bay. 
you might see a lot of value out of this. Let's play French Pass, you know, like maybe King of the Hill. French late game actually got a little bit of oomph behind it. Red Pass Landmark now activates an Arbalest weapon on all keeps and town sent it. Okay, I'm still probably going Red Pass. Is it only one? Or does it do what the red... Uh, it's got to be one. If it does what the red pass does, it's broken. Because if it does what the red pass does, I can just garrison everyone on a new keep and do more damage. Um, even then, like, even one Arbalest is like, you drop a keep on a building and it, it's, it's doing, like, 60 damage with an Arbor shot, right? Missile resistance on all buildings at 50. There's no red pass, but it's still effective. Um, I think people are still going to get calls of artillery. They already were in most cases. Red pass is usually kind of like a, you gave me a position you shouldn't have, and now I'm going to punish you. So Nice little changes for French. Nothing too drastic here. Chamber of Commerce, once again, Relic, you need to change the way that School of Cavalry works if you want this to be relevant. It's just too good at what it does to pass it up. Um, calls of artillery is a nice change, though. I like that. Although I feel like this was the go-to. Red pass is just bonkers situationally. HRE, mine went past landmark. Now holds two technologies unique to it. Riveted Chainmail, Spearman and Horseman, two melee armor. Interesting. So you can't just get that by default for the Spears anymore. And still Barding's Knights gain two armor. Well, this is a buff to a certain build for the HRE, but I don't think it's what people think it is. If you're going for Castle Age fast ending, I don't think you build mine work. But if you're going ultra late game, this one is good. And it's not for what you think. I don't care about spearmen. I care about horsemen. Late game, if you have like an open map and you're massing horsemen, right? An extra two melee armor is pretty decent. The ranged armor would have been nicer, but you'll take it for 250 resources. Is it good enough to pass up the efficiency of Arkin though? I'm going to say no on its own. But in conjunction with the increased research speeds and the discounts, there might be some viability behind this, but it will only be in multi-TC builds. I think if you go two TCs, you can you can kind of forsake the Ark and Chapel because you will have additional prelate production. And then you come back with the Regnets anyway and you have plenty of prelates. Um, but if you're doing your standard Castle Age Rush, no bueno. I, I still would go for Ark every day of the week. 1v1 on Pop. Recon, dude. I've got to get through these patch notes and then I've got to eat, dude. Maybe later tonight. Why do you want to 1v1 me? <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't fight me on Co Free. Right, so like, uh, what the hell is the crap? Uh, fix an issue where Regnet's landmarks does not correctly follow keybinds. Okay, uh, fix an issue where the emplacement discount bonus did not apply to naval arrow slits. Okay, that's actually kind of pog. That's actually very pog. Yeah, HRE buffed on naval maps. I think HRE just became even stronger on Medi. Because Medi is the map where you're most likely, in conjunction with Boulder Bay, to play into emplacements on your docks. Um, I still think number one for emplacement play is going to be the Abbasids, but this, like, if you're playing around emplacements, HRE just got a lot stronger. Um, maybe you now see on water hybrid maps them go for a little bit of a land push because now you could just go cheap emplacements, play kind of static and not engage on naval, and then, like, come over the top of fast castle into knights. So this, this change here will open up HRE's possibility of playing land on maps like Boulder Bay and Medi. Pick Delhi, I'm sure you can win. Oh, that's true, dude. <laughs> and they'll go back and cast my own game. <laughs> uh, yes, Daddy Pogsneck. We already talked about the buff to two-handed elite infantry and heavy maces. I already said, like, anyone who plays... Like, just a reminder on that one. Thank you for flagging that. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, if you're playing HRE and you, you've had that experience where you've went heavy maces and you just can't finish off a knight that runs into you, now you're going to do that. Because what was happening before is if your units would basically auto aggroed into the night and if they do a charging attack they were actually missing let's say you had two handed weapons and heavy maces your men at arms should have been doing 20 damage but instead they were just doing their base 12 as they were missing the extra six from heavy maces and the extra two from two handed weapons that's now been fixed so all those situations where you watched a knight get away with a third of their hp they're gonna die um so it's a nice little change there marlene's got shot in the kneecaps how many through are we here we've done over half right so we're not too far off. I think this is the sixth or seventh. Uh, Marlins. 
Mansa Quarry Landmark no longer displays as a resource production unit. <laughs> I don't know why it was doing that, but okay. From the Garrison Landmark and Fort of the Huntress Landmark footprint decreased. Okay. Yeah, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've just realized that they were big. I mean, you, you can't. I remember thinking about the Fort of the Huntress, but. For remember, for some reason, my brain didn't feel that big. I think it's just that we were already all looking at it, but it was huge. So, yeah, makes sense. Uh, fix an issue where javelin throws and arches that are upgraded while in queue at Frimba could take up more population than intended. That's kind of nuts. Okay, so yeah, buffs. <laughs> uh, Fort of the Huntress, where the Fort of the Huntress preferred rams as targets. Nice. Ooh, Griot Barra. Correct tooltip on the Siege Festival from 100% to 50%. Oh, it's kind of worse. That's for the torch damage and stuff, right? Or just siege. I never get to see the griot, so I always forget how it works. I quite like the idea. If I think it was the was the one that you could basically increase your torch damage, if I'm not mistaken. Um, technology tree now mentions that Malian villages have specific bonus of cows. Okay, added missing bonus for cheaper veteran unit technologies. Okay, so just a bunch of like fixes to UI mostly. Malian wonder footprint and structure size increased. Oh, got to keep everything in line. Torch damage and siege production. Thank you, Snores. Yeah, I really like the actual idea of Griot Barra in the late game. It's just Marlins never really need to be there. Um, usually end the game before that. House's health has been increased. Great. So um, Mongol's counter is now a little bit softer. Although in fairness, I think the Mongol counter was uh, to being the counter to the Marlins was being solved anyway. A lot of people were just building Donzos now and solving the problem entirely. So probably doesn't matter that much that House has got the health change like that. That is a substantial increase if you think about it, though. You're still paying 25 wood for a 500 HP structure versus an old 400. Local knowledge technology. Moved from Imperial to Castle Age. Wait, what one was that? I don't remember what tech that was. Oh, this is the one we talked about. So this is the one that lets your uh, Musafadis heal when they're stealthed. I remember talking about this. I think I even talked with someone at Wallalol about it. That it felt like it needed to be a Castle Age tech. It genuinely felt like it was just way too late to be useful in Imperial Age. And I was a little bit paranoid that maybe it gets a bit too OP in Castle Age, but we'd have to see. Seems I have the same opinion. So they reduced the cost of it and the research time, and now it's Castle Age. This is a nice change, actually. I, I think... You're going to get a little bit more bang for buck out of your Musafadi Warriors specifically. Gunners, it doesn't change at all. But for Musafadi Warriors, especially when you go on little flank attacks, like escaping, instead of just seeing stealth used to engage, we now might see it used to disengage and then heal up and come again. So Musafadi Warriors raid power just got increased um, a decent degree. It's not very expensive either. I mean, 150 and 250 gold you can afford, especially considering most of the cost is gold as a Malian. So expect this to see Musafadi Warriors... Um, Snowball more. I think with this change, it's more feasible to increase your count to Zerg levels than it was before. It's if if you engage with this correctly. Um, I don't know what building you need of this. I think it's maybe a blacksmith's or it's a racks. I think it's a blacksmith's. So if you're a Malian player, my advice would be don't just YOLO into your opponents as much. Finesse them and be efficient. Think of like when you play French Knights, right? You rush your Knights in, you see an injured one, you pull it back, the others continue to attack. If you start doing that with Musafadi Warriors, it's more micro heavy, but you're actually going to get good bang for buck now. Deers no longer get started by a run from stealth units. <laughs> I mean, I wonder how much that was mattering at the highest level. It'd be cool to imagine that it did though. Enemy buildings in Gaia no longer reveal units in stealth. What? Can I not dive the primary TC now then? I I mean I can run past the keep. Why are Marlins getting buffed? Like I I I don't think they need it. Like I said, don't necessarily nerf them, buff other people, but like don't buff them. TC still reveals towers, but do keeps as well. I assume they do. So this is actually still a, like a really strong thing, though I think. Enemy boom is just not like so. I, I can just run through like houses, everything else. 
it means me as an opponent against the Malians, if I want to prevent stealth attacks, I need to add more outposts, which is more resources burnt by me. I don't think this piece needed to be there. That is really strong. It also means I can just get past your fake points. Let's say like you had a mining camp that you've, you've, you've like exploited fully now. You might have used that as like pseudo info gathering, right? As a scouting point. Now I can run past that, run deeper and find where your eco really is. And by the time you see me, I'm already on top of you. The issue before was even a house would reveal them. But is that like bad? I don't know if that's like that bad, right? That even a house would reveal them. That's my point. Like if, if Marlins weren't as strong as they are now, I would agree with your like your thought process. But I think these extra parameters in place to prevent them uh, from like, you know, just going whatever made more sense. It just didn't usually work. Okay, I mean, like, we'll see how it plays out. But I think this is going to make it very easy to use Musafati Warriors. This also adds even more value into the local knowledge tech. Because now you'll be able to, like, just run past buildings and activate. You, you just run away from an engagement. You activate your stealth even if you're near buildings, and you'll just heal on your way to your next engagement. Yeah, this like I would agree with this change if it didn't come alongside nothing being changed about the Farumba issue, but it doesn't. So this is going to be too like this. This is going to snowball Moose Fuddy Warriors even harder. Like you might even see people just go away from Javelin Throws a bit more and even harder into Moose Fuddy Warriors, um, at least as they scale towards the raiding element of the the composition. Yeah, that's kind of nuts. Right, so we've got... Oh, we're almost done. All right, guys, so we've got two more sieves. Let's do this. Let's, let's roll it. Let's roll it, baby. Sorry, three more sieves. Mongols! Here we go. Silver tree, uh, silver tree tree landmark does not correctly follow hot... Okay, don't care. Cruel tie! Yes! I, I caught a glance at this, and I was so happy. I have... For anyone who has watched any of my streams, they will know that I have been incredibly critical of the cruel tie. I have called it the worst landmark in the game, and people have tried to bounce back arguments at me. But for the time you get it in the game, and the alternative thing you sacrifice, I still stand by it that in the current format, before Pup goes live, cruel tie is the worst landmark in the game. Or, bare minimum, bottom three. They've changed it. No longer requires the car nearby to apply damage buff. Brilliant. Stupid requirement, shouldn't have been there. Only made sense when it was a lingering effect. When they removed it as a lingering aura, bad. So this is a good change. Damage buff properly applies the bonus damage. It's the thing I've been complaining about this whole time. For those that don't understand what that means, before, if you built, let's say a trebuchet, let's go for um, a traction trebuchet. It's the easiest way to do this. Because I think it's the one you can see the biggest impact on. So traction trebuchet is like 50 base damage. 50 ban 50 wow 50 damage and then it gets 250 bonus against buildings 200 against ships in the old or the current core tie the one that's not no, we're talking pup we're talking the actual live one before pup your damage from the curl tie in this situation i believe it was a 25 percent damage buff that would increase your damage by a very 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 pathetic 12.5 damage now, with the changes, if you're attacking a building, it's saying, okay, you're, you're doing 300 damage. I'm going to add 25% into that. That's 75 damage extra. That is substantial. That's six times more damage you're now doing. Huge buff to the Kuril Tai. And a needed one as well. This also means that if you're countering a unit, you will be rewarded appropriately. I think one of the biggest cool things to think about is some like, let's say you're taking camel archers on with horsemen. Well, camel archers versus horsemen, before the issue you had is that, you know, like a horse, well, actually, no, it wouldn't matter there. Like, the, the point is like, well, you're going to ignore me. Like, I, I'm going back to my, my unease, but it applies across the board, right? So let's say, let's say I'm an archer. An archer does, uh, like, obviously I'll upgrade them, but the, let's say the base of the bases, I've still got my few age ones. I haven't got any upgrades. They do what, five damage and five extra against, um, Spearmen or Musafati Warriors, lightly armored units. Now, instead of me just getting 25% bonus on the five, I'm going to get a 25% bonus on both fives. So this this is like double damage, right? It's, it's, it's like doubling what you got from it before on units across the board. Uh, in some cases, even more. For Maganels, for Trebuchets. Remember, folks, Maganels also do bonus damage against buildings and also do bonus damage against ranged. So now, Maganels, they smash pretty damn hard. 
Because if you add six damage into a Magnell shot, right? Let's say you're going up against Archer. Archer has 80 health at that stage in the game. Um, before, you do 36 damage per Magnell, right? So it would take you three shots to kill off Archers. Now, with the 25% damage increase, it takes you two shots. No, sorry about uh, 18. It still takes you three shots though, right? So you get this. Let's do it correctly. So you do eight, six plus a 12, 18, uh, 36. And Archer's, I believe it's 90 health in Castle Age. Sorry, 80 and then 95. So 80 damage. Ugh, numbers. I'm doing too many numbers now. I'm getting hungry as well. So you do 16, uh, three, uh, sorry, 18, rather do three. Do, 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 do. So you do 54. So you kill them in two, right? But now, like, usually you don't get the full shot, right? Like, they spread out. You're doing damage on the edges, whatever. The point is now your kill threshold is going to be lower. So it's much easier to immediately punish archers or crossbowmen or whatever with mangoes. You're going to do substantially more damage um, because you're getting that 25% increase. So we said the number there, like, at the core of it, I said you were going to do um, 54. Uh, 54. Ugh. I'm bored of doing numbers. You can see but how I'm fudging them up. Um, times 1.25. No, that didn't even do it correctly. Thank you. 54x 1.25. 67.5. That's a pretty big booster for one unit that's doing AoE damage, right? So... It's essentially going to put archers on the edge of death. And of course, these are, there are other examples up against camel archers, whatever. The whole point, though, the, what I really love about this change, and they even increased the aura of it from 7.5 to 10 tiles, which is huge. Um, the important thing to take away from this change is now Kuril Tai is, is at least closer to the risk reward it needed to be. A big issue with Kuril Tai is if you're using it aggressively and you lose a fight, you lose the Kuril Tai. It's very difficult to get it back after that. Now, for that risk proposition, you're being given a substantially higher reward. So glad to see that change. Double clicking ranges also select longbow, the same with footmen men at arms. I'm not surprised by that. That's a small thing in the grand scheme of things. I want to see what the stats are on them. Uh, Carnet. The Carnet Palace now has changed to rally units from across the Dominion. You can get Roost Knights, Warrior Monks, Horse Archers, Nesta Bees, Palace Guard, Magadai, or the Hui Hui Pao Trebuchet. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, for anyone who doesn't know the Hui Hui Pao trebuchet, um, it is a godly huge thing. <laughs> it's a hilariously huge thing. If you played the campaign, you'll know it. Welcome back. Not welcome back. Goodbye. So for those that haven't seen this trebuchet, can I find... Welcome to Age of Empires 4. <laughs> Now, I'm hoping it's not a direct rip from the campaign because I think these things had like in excess of 20 tile range, which is quite frankly crack cocaine mixed in with speed. Like it's too much, man. I think it was like 20. I'm pretty sure it's like 20. It might have even been higher. So, so for reference, like there was a huge river in this campaign mission and you could fire across the river. <laughs> yeah, there is, there is, there it is, there it is. Oh, Zach, can we get back to it? Kind sir, can you show me? This is the so you could shoot from you see you saw the, the treb for a set there. So I'm hoping it's not a direct rip because this trebuchet is firing across this river. That's like 20 tower range, right? 2021, I think it was. For the love of God, don't let that be what we've got. <laughs> Yo, you're all worried about the English late game? Let me introduce you to the Mongol late game. Hey! <laughs> Not a good day to play China. <laughs> okay, fingers crossed it's not that extreme though. Um, but cool to see it coming in. Train times are scaled based on the unit, but in general spawn much faster than the previous 90 seconds. But it's still random, right? Or do you choose? If you choose, I'm choosing Hui Hui Pao every day of the week. <laughs> and they do more damage? Oh, man. All right, guys. Mongols are back. <laughs> White Stupid now contains Uvu technologies. Okay. Mongol Boomers now show additional building menus. Yep, okay. Uh, improved tech tiles upgrade, cool. Influence range now shows correctly during selection stage. Cool. Signal arrow. Increase the range and decrease the cost. Nice. Uh, the signal arrow, if I remember correctly, is the one that increased the duration of 
the Khan's arrows. So it was nice. It was situational. A lot of people still passed up on it. This is a nice little change. And now you don't have to stop when you uh, activate the Falcon. So that's not too bad. Yeah, I think we've kind of covered the main changes here. Wait, 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 what? Fix the bug where Dark Age Spearman had 12 torch damage instead of the intended 10. Oops. <laughs> Hold on a second. So you're telling me this whole time the Mongol early burn has only been as good as it was because of... Oh, man. That's actually going to screw with the Mongol timings. If you go for an outpost rush, you now need more value out of it before. Because it used to be that you go for the outpost rush, you get your spearman out, you torch down the building. The return time has now been delayed, so this actually might impact Mongols' tech up timings and delay them. Biggest change most definitely is still the Krotai and the Karnet Palace. I mean, like, Nesta Bees would be really good. If you can get your hands on the Hui Hui Palace, really nice. Um, I think those are the two you're aiming for. Maybe actually Warrior Monks. The, what, what? Warrior Monks is actually kind of insane because you get the ins you, you buff and you've like maybe got Yam in the fight as well, or you get like the damage buff and the attack speed arrow. Like that's that could be substantial. So your free priority is going to be the the Hui Hui Pao, um, the Warrior Monk, and Nesta Bees in that order. Okay, so it's 18 tower range and 75 damage plus 600 versus buildings. Hui Hui Pao is about to clap. Whew. Arrow Kurotai Mongols, uh, Monks rather. Yeah, maybe if you can get the Kurotai. They're like, honestly, there's a lot of buffing layering going on here for the Mongols. Their late game is like substantially stronger than it was, but there is a high level of execution for it to work. You thought your opponents cheated with buff Dark Age Pikes? Only if they're playing hardest AI. <laughs> But yeah, seriously, don't underwrite this change, by the way, folks. Uh, and also, wow, early, ho yeah, early horsemen had less charge damage than their base weapon. That's kind of nuts. So I think horsemen might be a little bit better now. You might even see people go for horsemen openers a little, a little now and then. Um, the spearman opener, I think you need better outpost placement to justify now. Just because you're getting the return on the investment through burning buildings slower. And that's occupying your spearman longer. And if you're not very optimal your timings it maybe offers up people opportunities to save their buildings before you torch them and kill your spearmen so the, these these two changes actually might have a bigger impact than seems apparent um especially this one by the way early horsemen now as a mongol player to deny scout vision might be really useful because now you you're able to chase and you're able to actually more likely take them down all right quickly check ottomans fix the minaret madrasa sometimes trapping units <laughs> What do you mean you don't want to be bathed in the bush? Okay, you spend your whole life desiring to be deep in bush. We're just giving you what you wanted. Mehmed Imperial Armory Landmark can now be toggled to produce batting rams. Of course, it's going to be added. Very pog, very pog. Hopefully, they get produced quickly. <laughs> Not too quickly, though. Could you imagine? What if someone actually goes for like a ram rush build with the Ottomans? Would it work? Passively producing rams. Depends how low the cooldown is, but there's maybe a world where that happens. We'll see. Fixed an issue where it was possible for the landmark to repeatedly stack its bonus effect from the Istanbul Imperial Palace. Okay. I mean, I haven't seen the, the Istanbul uh, Imperial Palace in a long time, so I can't comment on that one. Seagate. Fix an issue where traders could not garrison with the landmark. No longer loses its ability to buff traders when another landmark is destroyed. <laughs> Why was it losing its ability when any other thing was destroyed? I'm glad we're ironing these kinks out, though. Uh, incendiary arrows technology. Corrected an issue where archers and crossmen would lose their fire arrows after upgrade. Good God, man. There's so many issues with the Ottomans. It's like we just didn't notice because we ended the game much sooner than this point, right? Um, Ottoman Grand Galley. Adjusted help text to reflect that the ship contains garrison slots after converting into a military school. Yeah, because that wasn't clear. I'm glad they done that. I still have not seen a single person use Ottomans Grand Galley as well. For those that don't know, the way the Grand Galley works is that you can change it from being a, an attack ship into a military school. I think you have to like deploy it on the edge, on the banks of something, and then it will start passively generating units that end up garrisoned inside it, and then you can unload them. I think that's how it works. Or can you do it on the water? You might be able to do it on the water. But the, the whole point is that it's like a mini military school on water. Um, I think the concept is still really confusing for a lot of players. It's very hard to use as well. Like from, from a getting it in your build perspective, I remember I saw the Muslim try to mass them, they, they couldn't even defend themselves against like a few archer ships. It was, it's a pretty rough one to deal with. 
they were worth having over another military school. Wait, it doesn't use your military school slots though, right? It's set, like you. The point is, you can get these and military schools, correct? If if they take military school slots, I agree. This is just bad. It does use a slot. Okay, this is yeah. This is, I agree. Then Kamroth, this is just bad. It'd probably be OP if it didn't use a slot. But at the same time, this is just like terrible. This just seems terrible. I'd be better off building a military school sooner and then garrisoning a, a transport ship. That's probably why I haven't seen anyone use the Altman Grand Galley well, because like I feel like building this would lose you the game. Because um, the thing is, like, remember, it's the Grand Galley, so it's a naval unit, and you're only going to build it on water maps. But like, when are you going to build it that it's going to be viable? I think like. For this to be viable, you already have to have water control. And let's be totally honest, if you already have water control, you don't need an Ottoman Grand Galley. You just transition to normal land and win anyway. Um, yeah, th th this one's kind of a miss for me. A cool idea, but just doesn't work. Meta now correctly activates and applies their aura after being ungarrisoned. Okay, the meta needs to be nerfed. How has the meta not been nerfed? So we've discussed this in length, and I think everyone, like, everyone I've talked to has kind of been in the same opinion. The main problem with the meta is he has too much health. Way too much health. Meta should scale with health similar to the King and the Khan. That's that's my opinion on it. They are way too easy to use as a pseudo tank in early skirmishes, which can build a snowball lead. Um, another issue, which I'm not sure if the devs are aware of. Um, I don't know if Winston's still here. I should probably message him if not. There is a bug. I have a video that I'm going to release uh, of Marine Law playing against Recon that shows it off. I, I assume it's a bug or like it's exploitative feature right like it's not like you know let's let's use palisades to see through fog but it, it is like kind of silly is that if you you can actually speed up your meta and units on the other side of the map if you select them together and, and then give them a move order so what i mean by that is if i have a um let's say like this is the map and i have a meta my meta is my orange is here um this is my base this is the enemy's base. And here's my horseman. If I get the movement speed aura, Vizier point, and I select these units together and I click a point, what's going to happen is these units are going to get the movement speed aura, if I'm not mistaken. It's like, it's it's insanely ridiculous. So like they get the movement speed benefit because of the, the formation. Um, and we tested this and like Marino was doing it. And what was happening is... Because he was in formation, this unit over here was like he was drumming himself faster. Like they, these units, of course, went in aura range. Uh, I said that wrong. Ignore me in that part. The the drummer boy though was moving faster to get across the map because he was registered as in a formation, even though the units aren't there for the formation. And the way you could exploit this, by the way, is um, you might select your meta and you'll click him a bunch of points to move to, like this, 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 this. this. And then you would shift select these guys and then give them a click to wherever these guys need to go. And then that registers as like information. So he would now just move. Um, ignore, actually, what I've done this last time. I don't know why I put these clicks. You don't need all these clicks. You literally just give your meta one click to move across the map where they're going to be with them. Um, and then you shift click them in on the second one. And that, if I remember correctly, was giving the... I'm gonna have to test it again. It's been like two or three weeks since we covered this, but like the the whole point is the meta, even though he didn't have any units to be in formation with, was moving across the map uh, quicker than he should have, because he's not really in the formation. Um, I'll I probably will have to do like a dissect breakdown, just like a, a two minute video to upload to YouTube to show that off cleanly. Um, Marine Lord done it really well though. Uh, it, it was absurd. Like he his metas should not have been across the map that quick. That's intended. He drum. He drums really loud when his allies are far away. Yeah, just getting closer, right? <laughs> but there's a bunch of things with the the meta the silly. Uh, the silly. The meta is essentially Yam and Network of Castles in one. Um, he does a lot, too much. I know I'm gonna get scrutinized the way I describe that on the YouTube list because I'm trying to rush through because I don't want to spend too much time on it. We've went it through it. There'll be a there'll be a video up between Marine Lord and Recon where they played it in the game and it happened and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's it's quite nuts. Let's run out with the Rus. Kremlin's been changed. Now they have the Levy Militia uh, to the landmark town center. The ability costs 100 food and can be activated every three minutes. Militia are a fast, lightly armored unit that have a 90 second lifetime. 
So this was clearly intended to fix the static nature of Kremlin as a defense tool. And I think we saw this brilliantly in a game recently between Salami and Demos. I see recently last month where Salami made a really smart play to drop a Kremlin against what he expected to be Lombo rushes from the English. It wasn't very effective when the English player decided to go full greed and just tech up, come over the top. Now with this type of ability, if they just do that, you can react. Someone I think that they're going to need to be careful with, and it depends on the stats and the movement speed, I don't think that this unit is going to be used defensively. I think it's going to depend on how many there are, but let's say there's five or six units for 100 food that last three minutes, uh, last 90 seconds rather. Can I actually get them across to my opponent's base? Because if I can, the proposition then is if I can idle five villagers for 20 seconds or more, maybe even kill one, it's actually not a bad resource trade, right? Because five villages every minute will get you uh, 200 resources. So then if I owe them for, let's say, 30 seconds, I will really return my cost. I actually think that levy militia is going to be used aggressively, not defensively. 90 seconds is like a decent amount of time. Like if you're talking horsemen, 90 seconds to me is enough time for me to get in your base for, and be there for like 20 or 30 seconds, right? Now, they did at least do this smart play because if they had actually made it so the Levy Militia came out the Kremlin, it would be broken because people... I, I guarantee you, if they made it so that Kremlin spawned the Levy Militia, people would be Kremlin dropping their opponent's base. That being said, if the Levy Militia is as strong aggressively as I just described, people could still aggressively drop a Kremlin because then that gives them a staging point to rush in with Levy Militia from. I think they may have just created a little bit of cheese here, folks. We'll have to see on the pop, but... I mean, if we've got any high-level players on, have some fun with it. Go drop a Kremlin in your opponent's base and Levy Militia. Because although you're going to run them from your landmark TC, if the Levy Militia, which consider they're considered uh, fast and lightly armored, I'm assuming horseman speed. If they're horseman speed, oh my. Okay, Kamarov said they spawn six. They have 85 health and six attack. That's pretty good. I'm going to dive those. In. I, I mean, when we play some pop, I'm legit going to dive those underneath a TC, I think. Am I the only one thinking that? 1.5 movement speed? That's still pretty good. I'd have to do the master. Like, I think you'd have a 20, 30 second window to harass underneath TC, right? I think that could still be good. I'm going to have to experiment with that. You got them to the enemy base with 20 seconds left. It depends on map though, right? So let's say Mountain Clearing, for example. Dude, Mountain Clearing Kremlin. Oh, my God. <laughs> if you've got a map where you theoretically spawn closer, I think it's going to be good. We'll have to see um, how it plays out. Let's move on to the rest. This is like a step in the right direction, though. Like, Kremlin needed something. This is definitely a start. Um, if these, I think if the Militia get bonus damage against Cavalry, then this is actually a decent change, and the Kremlin might have some situational usage. But I think it needs that as well. Abbey the Trinity. Saints effect. Wait, Saints reach effect increase from 3 to 5 tile range? Dude, that's big. Oh, wait, this is even bigger. Saints reach and improved blessing merged into one tech. Renamed to Fervor. Fervor improves the range of Saints blessing by 5 tiles and the damage granted by 1. 10 tile range on Saints reach. That's actually that's substantial. That means that you'll actually be able to buff your full range line. I think we're going to see Warrior Monks coming back into the composition for Roos. Because for Roos, it's kind of moved out. I think Roos in a lot of ways have become this static kind of night spammy sieve in a lot of ways, like a discount French. Um, so this is going to give it more flex to bring others back in. Like this damage increase matters more on things like archers, crossbows, horse archers than it does on knights because knights' base damage is already so high. So the percentage-wise isn't that big of an increase. And they have a new tech. They increase their health by 100 HP. Only available in Imperial Age. Kind of interesting there. Um, I don't know if you needed to make an Imp. If it's Imp, I think maybe less gold. I don't think Saints Veneration is going to be that big of a deal. It's kind of nice though, because in Imperial Age, you're looking for efficiency in terms of pop cap, right? So increasing a unit's health by 100 makes it more efficient. So you maybe need less Warrior Monks to keep your buff going, which means you can produce more of a different unit. So it's a nice change. Um, high trade le Whoa. Deer's spawn on the high trade house landmark has been decreased from 60 to 45. That's a very big buff. That's going to actually allow you to now cap out on average like 
three minutes sooner if you're not already there, right? Three, four minutes sooner. I think the change to Abbey of Trinity make it desirable as well, though. A lot of people are moving to High Trade House, but someone I want people to keep in mind before they say High Trade House is just going to win here, um, which I've heard one or two players say already, is Abbey of Trinity. Remember that the Saints Blessings improvements, a lot of them are unique to the Abbey of Trinity. So the increase in like damage, the increase in tower range, the increase in duration, these are all unique techs to the Abbey of Trinity. So if you want to go for a Warrior Monk comp that's relying on those buffs, you have to build Abbey of Trinity. So I think depending on your build structure, Abbey of Trinity, like what well, your comp wants to be, right? In Castle Age, Abbey of Trinity is still going to be viable, even with the buffs to High Trade House. Oh, and just to round out someone's thought, good idea. The ball could be used to take out the... Um, uh, sorry, the ball. The militia could be used to take out the ball. That's actually a solid play. Um, if it's solid enough, I'm not sure. I think actually what the Kremlin is going to do, now that you mentioned that, Kremlin's going to be very good for securing a ball. Not just through killing the ball, but now if you see me move, make a move out onto a ball site and you react with like two or three spearmen, I've now got six units to push you away which even if they eventually are going to expire the time i'm going to get of 90 seconds and let's say it takes me 45 to reach a ball location it's going to give me 45 seconds to set up a wooden fortress the build time on a wooden fortress actually isn't that much longer right wooden fortress i think it's 55 sorry 50 so 50 seconds i'm covering myself for most of that so actually, I think that that's a pretty strong change towards boar plays. Uh, if you want to go boar, I think Kremlin makes more sense now. High armory. Technology in the high armory have been updated. Fine-tuned guns. Effects change from 20% bombard attack speed to 20% bombard damage. And now adds 60... Wow, 60 bonus damage versus infantry for bombards. So, Streltsy gun not big enough. Get bigger gun. Keep in mind, this is in combination with a buff to the cost. You're paying less wood now for bombards. It's only versus infantry, though. I still think you're vulnerable to cavalry raids. It's a cool little addition, but I don't really see a roost player building too many siege units in the late game still. Siege crew training, uh, effective instant pack unpack now also applies to bombards. Okay, that could change things a little. So S Roos could now play a very slow kind of siege comp with like five or six bombards and effectively snipe out your units. Um, there is still a weakness which is going to be Springholds, but of course remember the Roos can get Springholds with additional range. The banded arms gives them an extra 0.5 tower range. Um, so Roos mass siege late game might work now. This is definitely... You can see the effort by the developer, by the way. Relic are trying to bring Siege back in as a, a logical part of gameplay because in a lot of ways, like late game Siege especially has fallen off. People might build one or two bombards because they need to get through a wall, but people aren't committing to like six to eight Siege plus, right? Like they've kind of stopped that. People are really hard on the mass horse, knights, bull in the infantry, whatever. Um, cool idea to bring back in. And Wandering Towns, someone said we're going to get to this. Remember, they buffed Rams. There's now going to be the light uh, bar so you can get extra attack speed on the rams looks like to bounce that out they have decreased the damage increase from wandering towns so overall wandering towns has been nerfed because the increase in the attack speed i believe was 40 percent so you you just at a loss in that regard yes so lightweight beams extra 40 percent attack speed um so actually wandering towns got nerfed Weirdly enough. A little bit surprising as well. But it now also grants two healing per second in combat to Rams. That maybe makes it a bit better. Especially with the discussion we were having about Springles earlier. I think actually Roos Rams might become quite godly. The issue I do see is Ram like they've definitely hard pivoted to try to make Roos late game about siege. But you can't build all these things. You have to like choose now, right? You're either going for Rams or you're going for Bombards. Running Towns was OP. Yeah, but it's like still pretty much there, Recon. Right? It's actually better in a lot of ways. 
Like I'm saying, this is this is a nerf to Wandering Towns. Like the damage output, it's a nerf, right? It's a 40% attack speed buff with another tech, but you lost 50% damage. But I agree, like with everything included, like Wandering Towns is really good. And overall, it's a buff because now you can build rams out of siege workshops. You can also build them in the field 50% faster if you go into the, uh, what was it called, lightweight beams. Yeah, late game for Roos is popping. Not gonna lie. I actually think late game is, is popping for Roos. Like, I don't know if... I wouldn't say that they are Siege Kings. I don't think they're far off, though. Like, they're, they're, they might be, like, top three Siege now. Because the flexibility of Bombards in conjunction with how good Wandering Town plus um, Lightweight Beams is. Is there a better Civ, really? Like, things like the Hui Pa Pao for the Mongols could be pretty good. But it's like, you don't know if you're going to get it or when you're going to get it. Um... Have they made Spaskai? That's why I need to check if Spaskai is even viable afterwards. Health increase from 8k to 10k. Guys, are you noticing a theme here? Like, between the Berkshire and this as well, like, it feels like there's a big pivot towards these heavy castles later on in the game that are meant to kind of slow things down a bit. And they fixed a bug with Siege Crew training upgrade for free. Okay. Um... But that's it for the Spaskai. They didn't change anything else. In fairness, people looked like they were moving away from high armory. But I think that was more because Siege was less viable. So now that Siege is more viable, and the fact that Spaskai didn't get much else added, and with how little I've actually seen Roos players building stone, Wolves, I think that there's going to be a heavy pivot towards high armory again. Like, remember, high armory still has the, the discount buff around it. Uh, which, by the way, like you, so you've just like discounted the cost of bombards by 100 wood across the board. Now you're still on top of that, discounting like the the wood remaining and gold cost. So bombards are incredibly cost efficient for the roots. Like you're paying what 600 resources, a little bit over 600 resources, 680 something like that, 675. Yeah, this is a really good like cost proposition. Wait, my, my brain, I'm just going to, like, I'm not going to trust myself. I'm too hungry. I need to go eat. We're almost ready to go eat, but like, we're going to see this out. Um, wait, why am I doing a divide? So it's 900 times uh, 0.75. Wait, what? Do I put in 900? 675. Yeah, yeah, we were right. Okay, so 675. I mean, that's pretty good. Considering this unit is now going to like counter pretty much any infantry, right? Because a bombard's base damage is, I believe, was either 100 or 90. Which means that you're one hitting hand cannon is. It's 100 plus the extra 60. You're one hitting hand cannon is, guys. That's really good. So, like. Wait, oh, this is oh, the wrong game. Ugh. Rubbish game. Give me the right one. 130. You are one hitting hand cannoneers. Hand cannoneers cost 240 resources. So once you've killed three of them, you've paid for a bombard. Now, remember, you're still going to be countered by cavalry, right? Like, cavalry don't take that bonus damage either. That's, I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, I think bombards are coming back into the hard, back into the meta for Roos. All the keep landmarks are underperforming, they buff them. The late ones, I kind of agree. The early ones, not at all. Um, Kremlin, like, yeah, but that was for different reasons. Uh, Barbican, come on, dude. <laughs> like, that's, that's what I'm calling you out, by the way. It's basically Barbican. Like, you're correct, the other ones. Um, I think also, I like the fact they didn't buff the Ottomans because the sea, uh, with the sea fort, because, like, there's not enough data on that right now. Not enough games have played that late to, to justify a buff. Uh, let's finish this out, though. Streltsy unit. Corrected an issue with the static deployment, I believe, where it's possible for it to trigger for a brief moment despite moving. Yep, glad that kind of busted. Bless, uh, blessing duration technology renamed to Divine Light. Okay. Roof deep water fish have been nerfed. We saw that earlier. And then they improved the Palisade Walls in terms of build speed, but reduced health. But they reduced the health in normal ones. So I think Roofs are going to go up to like mid tier at least, maybe even higher, depending on if people can find some very interesting builds with the Kremlin. Roos's late game to me is probably top three now or top four. I don't think their economy is maybe good enough, but 
the quality of their units, especially around Siege now, might allow them to be top four, top three. Like, 100% percent the top five, even with this amount. Like, it's nice to see Roos actually get that kind of love. And it's a very subtle way it's been done, but it's an effective way. So I appreciate the elegance that Relic have put into that. Um, so probably rounding out thoughts, like, looking back at this, um, I really want to see more modding stuff, by the way. Relic, can we get more modding stuff sorted? Thank you. Um, I know that's completely different to what this patch is intended, but come on. Yeah, so big takeaways. AI, 100% disagree with this approach, the way hardest AI is being um, fixed. Really hope the next patch reverts this and brings in something more interesting because otherwise you're creating a house on a very shaky foundation that is going to bite you in the ass five patches from now. And the AI just makes no sense anymore. And people, like people, will, I, I guarantee you, people don't like being cheated. This is cheating. What well, you've given the AI is cheating. Um, but let, focusing on the gameplay related things, the big takeaways for me were probably like fishing is an interesting alteration. It's a slight subtle thing, but the changes to fishing should mean that losing the initial fights on Navy, uh, on the Navy side doesn't necessarily mean you've lost the game outright, right? There's opportunities to come back a little because of the buffs to shorelines and the nerfs to deep water fish. It's still going to be a, a compounding effect. It's still going to be a big benefit from deep water fish compared to shoreline, but there's a little bit more breathing room. There's maybe an extra minute or two for you to try and make a strike back out into the deep. Um, Outside that, siege buffs are very interesting. A lot of siege changes across the board that feel like they're trying to push that back into the meta. Bombards especially are underrepresented. Love the alterations to the French to make them a little bit more in the late game because right now French to me and Imperial is just mass knights until you run out of gold. Now you have a more slow methodical approach with the changes to their cannons. Um, Roos also getting their buffs. Love that. Love the ram change. The ram change was a really big one for me. I think Rams failed to scale in the late game. And now, I don't know if I'm going to say they're busted, but they are incredibly strong. Some of them I want you guys... Dude, my hair is actually annoying me. Some of them I want you guys to remember about Rams is that they only cost one pop cap. That's why this is a substantial buff to them across the board. But the lightweight beams, then the things what, uh, that the Roost can do, you're going to see a lot more ramification even the later phases in the game. Uh, especially when you consider it only costs 250 wood. It's quite cost efficient. Especially if your opponent doesn't necessarily have a full melee comp. The whole idea of Rams is obviously to break players that are playing too defensive. Um, with these changes, they're definitely ticking that box. Like if someone goes mass range units, they're not going to be a, a very impactful solution to what you're doing. Um, and you're now, with things like lightweight beams, going to be able to get more value out of them not appropriately prepping a counter ahead of time. Whereas before, let's say you had the old attack speed, you know, they saw rams coming, they take long enough to arrive, they take long enough to attack, you could easily build up stables, build up horsemen. Now, sure, they're going to take a while to arrive, but the increased attack speed, once they start engaging, also the fact that someone can just rush them up in the field 50% faster, uh, it means that you might be able to like break walls, break keeps before someone is able to build a counter force to the rams. Other big things, I think Abbasids are just that they are going like top three now. Maybe that's a bold statement, but I think they could easily be top three. The trade wing is the big one to me. Trade wing just immediately giving you free traders. It seems so trivial for me to say that's what's going to make them top three. But if you consider what it took to make the Mongols look as good as they were with trading with the silver tree, like genuinely free traders is really all you need to force a reaction. Remember that Aries 4 is a game of reactions. So if you can force your opponent to pivot and hard counter what you're doing, you have the advantage. It's what made the silver tree so dominant is that you essentially could just go two traders max, maybe four, and your opponent had to act like you were going to go for 20. This trade wing is going to have a similar impact, right? Maybe they can kind of like play off the fact I'm not building a marketplace behind it, so then don't think I'm going to scale it, but I'm still going to have three traders that should be able to influx my gold and, and get me to a fast castle. Um, as we mentioned with that one, I think the culture wing is going to lead the way. A lot of people are going to play into the culture wing first, assuming a faster castle each timing, but trade will win out eventually. Um, China, not too much to really talk about there, of course. Um, Delhi, I, I'm somewhat baffled by Delhi getting buffed the way they did. I mean, if you ask pretty much any pro player what they think of Delhi, they say OP straight away. And Delhi, although they have the nerf to their healing, everything else has been buffed across the board. Whether the change to healing is going to be enough to offset them, I'm not really sure right now. I think there's still going to be some dominant Delhi builds. And there's still ones being discovered around the Tower of Victory that are going to allow you that map presence that forces your opponent to do something rash that can cost them the game. Leading on from that healing change, Ottomans 
Although it's only a few tweaks and not too much has changed in terms of like raw stat changes, I think the Ottomans definitely got buffed a lot from the healing change. The early double Imam play with the AoE heal of one health a second is going to be substantial here considering it hasn't been nerfed. So expect the Ottomans to perform even better than Delhi than we've seen them perform in recent weeks. They actually might be the classic Delhi Slayer actually moving forward. And overall, with the amount of people who are playing Ottomans with the double Imam early on, um, I expect that build to spike in popularity and impact uh especially if you're playing against civs that don't usually want to build range units early on they want to go for melee they're going to struggle civs like the french might run into trouble town central up against the ottomans english are bonkers actually uh the king does at least scale so you can snipe him early on but the fact that you've now got essentially chivalry on the go from tier two is incredibly potent uh, especially when you consider how often english players go into knights in tier three i need to see the impact is going to be around the tier four landmark changes, but my feel is that the Barkshire may be too powerful here. You know, and if you're a Mongol player, unless you can luck out and get your Hui Hui Pao trebuchet, you're not going to actually have a way of taking out a Barkshire without essentially throwing away a lot of siege or units. Um, the Wingard Palace, I need to test the new unit types, but this kind of Wingard Raiders play, definitely going to have some viability in the first two or three minutes of Imperial Age when you're essentially doing this kind of later timing. Uh, Burgrave rush, right? And it is going to be a rush because it's going to be horsemen and knights. After that, Wingard Rangers and Footmen, I'll have to see how they perform their unique new unit being introduced. But if you do fail after the initial few minutes of Imperial Age, the price you're paying to push out Wingard Raiders might not be a good proposition compared to the Wingard Army that still has a trebuchet. So expect English players to still return to that. French, we already mentioned their Imperial Age got buffed a little bit. I'm just going to round out my thoughts on them by saying Chamber of Commerce still sucks. Do not be baited in. Please, if you actually find someone that works, I want to see it. Send the replays to me. I'll check them out. But my take is that giving up a 20% raw boost to production speed on all stables that you ever build in a game is never going to be pipped or surpassed by automatically training one free trader for each economic technology you research, which is what the Chamber of Commerce now does. Um the big buff around the artillery now having huge AOE splashes, I need to see that in action, but I've got a feeling that French might be able to play slow comps now and take over the Imperial Age without relying just on mass knights. We'll have to see how that develops. HRE, really big changes around the way that they interact up against heavy cavalry specifically from my take. I expect men at arms to be a lot more impactful at shutting down raids where before they felt helpless. Uh, on top of that, the change to Mindwork Palace might not lead to too much immediately, but if we see more de deviation into things like double TC or even triple TC, I'm expecting double TC though, um, HRE builds, then it's more forgivable to give up Ark and Chapel due to additional prelate production, and that will lead to late game timings around riveted chainmails, which of course gives the extra armor over to horsemen. Ignore the spearman detail. It's so where they're going to thrive is going to be with the horsemen. Uh, spearmen can still have a value of Langsnet comps, but a lot of the time people have been prepping the appropriate counters to that in Imperial Plus. When we look at the Marlins, Marlins seemingly have just been brushed a little bit, but not really. They've been tickled. They haven't been tackled. And that's going to be a problem here. In fact, if anything, they got buffed. The changes around Musafadi Warriors now having access to the local knowledge that gives them chivalry type heal in Castle Age, quite cheaply, in fact, is a big deal. Remember, the way that works is when you're stealthed, you're going to actually heal. Keep that in mind. At the moment, the way Musafadi have worked is people just clamber in with all their troops and they throw them away willy-nilly able to replace them. Now, they're going to have a way of healing them out in the field. They just have to pull back and hit the stealth button. Musafadi Zerg is going to amplify from high-level players. Anyone that puts the effort into microing back injured units is going to take over the game much quicker than what we've seen previously in the Musafadi. So, expect Malian picks to go up uh, and solutions are still being sought out by the community. Um, rounding out from that, as we look at the later ones, we talked about the Mongols. Cruel Tide buff could be big here. It's going to give a very strong time to the Castle Age of the Mongols where they can try to end the game. Probably around a comp that involves Siege Engineering Improved and building Maganels as well as Traction Trebuchets that now get their bonus damage against buildings and other units buffed by 25% as well. Not to mention that bigger aura makes it more easy to use the Cruel Tide without having to shift and pack it up constantly. Uh, the change to the Carnet Palace also looks quite fun. I think in the Imperial Age, things get a little bit nutty, but we 
we already mentioned the real takeaway there. Your premium units you're aiming towards is probably Hui Hui Power, depending on how good the stats are. After that, it's 100% going to be Warrior Monks and then Nesta Bees. Warrior Monks because you'll be able to give the Aura buff across your entire army or whoever's close to it. Um, and also, they're going to be a pseudo heal along the incredibly tanky. So, could be impactful. A uh, big thing to look for, though, is still going to be that timing for the Mongols in Castlade with the Kurotai. I think it's going to be substantial here. Outside that, um, early game with the changes to the spearmen with their damage going down to 10 when it was actually at 12 on torches, you might see less value in outpost rushes or more a refined timing required. So if you're delayed slightly in your outpost rush, it might be harder to exploit value and you might suffer from slow few delays timings as a result. Ottomans, we already mentioned uh, briefly some of the things around them. The other big takeaway, Grand Galley still not there. I don't think this is going to work for them. Uh, meta Untouched is very surprising in conjunction with the other details we already said around the Imam's healing. I think the meta not being touched could actually bump Ottomans up in the tier to an even stronger position than they're already in. And keep in mind, this is a sieve that still has two very dominant builds, one around that Castle Age timing and another around the Feudal Archer spam. I think Ottomans are going to continue to dominate, easily a top five sieve, probably towards the top four. Um, Roost with their changes, their late game just got heavily buffed. The fact that they've got giant ass sniper rifles in the form of bombards, it'll do bonus damage. It means that if you get the late time and the game slows down and people start to switch into premium units, the Roost should be able to trade more favorably than essentially any other sieve in the game. There's still a heavy weakness towards things like horsemen though that could make you shrivel up and die, but the changes towards rams that we mentioned earlier with the light beams in conjunction with the way Wandering Towns is still pretty damn good means that I actually see the Roos having a pretty cost-efficient late timing in the game, especially when you add on the fact that while most sieves are paying 250 wood for rams, yes, Roos are paying that too, but it's more like they're actually paying 200 wood due to the fact that their influence from the Wooden Fortresses give them an extra 20% wood. So, takeaways... Rounded up there. Uh, if you guys like what you saw here, make sure that you go across the Twitch side. You follow me there. I do appreciate money, so definitely send me the primes, especially if you've got Twitch Prime. Uh, make sure you subscribe here on the YouTube channel. This is going to be the end of the video. If you want to catch more action, I am live pretty much about three times a week, at least is the goal right now. And YouTube uploads are on the daily. But I am done. I'm going to go eat, and then when we return later, I'm going to enjoy the pop i'm gonna enjoy getting stomped by some people and probably stomping some people with some early kremlin drops in the base because i forgot to mention that at the end Roos kremlin with militia rushes into the enemy base might be viable we're gonna find out uh, make sure you check on twitch.tv for slash killer pigeon everyone in chat say hi and bye to youtube um because we are done entertaining them hopefully you enjoyed what you saw here and uh let me know what you thought let me know if you think i'm uh, too big of a nerd or from one point or whatever it is and hopefully next time we have patch notes we'll be doing this again